jobs and hotels then stock Northern Ireland produce. Look how amazing Bush Mills is as a brand. Imagine what could be achieved if we enabled our local producers the ability to grow and develop. I will indeed. I would ask the member, can she help this House understand how she arrived at the figure of 208? You know, why was there not an alternative figure? I have to go back to our considerations at committee stage. 104 was brought forward, but there was no consultation with local producers after that. The producers themselves asked me if they were going to be forced to operate from 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., which is six hours a day, then they would need to be open at least four days a week in order for them to be able to employ someone to work in that tap room. I will. The member will be aware of the extensive lobby from Hub Hospitality Ulster, which represents a very large proportion of the licensed trade. And I have to say that the, the information given by Mr Colin Lee, the Chief Executive, is very compelling. First of all, does she not accept that it's possible to set up a local brewery for as little as £10,000? Meanwhile, many of our licensed traders are paying that a quarter in rates, uh, an incredible burden. Secondly, how does she police this? Uh, you're, she says that, of course, the only products from the brewery can be sold in the tap room. Who's going to check that? Do you expect the PSNI to go round and say, that's Bush Mills, no, that, uh, I'm trying to think of drinks, no, that's Jemison's, etc. Who's actually going to prove that this, the product being sold is actually the product being produced by the brewery? And finally, why? given the fact that she wishes to promote tap rooms, why can that not be done on the lower 108 days a year, uh, rather than her, 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 her basically doubling it? If, if they wish to exhibit their product, why can that be done in a lesser number of days? I thank the member. I'll deal with his last um, point first. Six hours a day, two days a week, means 12 hours. They can't get anyone to work in their premises. And I'll just point to, um, as the Chair said, the suitability of the premises must first be determined before the licence can be granted. So what we're asking these local producers to do is to amend their premises to be suitable, to be honest, for the public to go in and be able to drink in those premises. You have to make sure that the place is safe, that there are toilets on board. People will be taking alcohol, and we have to make sure that they're safe. But what we're saying to this group of producers is you can only sell for 12 hours a week. And that's why they have come back and have said, double the number of days, please. That will make it financially viable for us to be able to be tap rooms. I will do. Thank you. Um, uh, Mr Wells pointed to the costs for, for other businesses. Does the member have any idea what it costs for local producers to set up? Um, I'm hearing figures of £80,000. Um, so uh, and further, the suggestion in and around the hours could that be mitigated if the longer, if the days were longer? You know, would you potentially accept uh, less days if there was longer hours per day? The member, I'll take the member back to the way that this bill will go. Um, Amendment 25 is the minister's proposal for the 104 days. We know that that can be amended through regulation. However, on the face of this bill, if we stick to 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., that's it. That doesn't get changed. Now, if amendment number 25 goes forward and amendment number 30 goes forward, my amendment 31 is not taken anyway. So we've got 104 days, 6 hours a day, 12 hours a week. If we extend it from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. to cover a period that is reasonable, and not everyone has to apply for the full amount of time. We know already that there are cideries, for instance, who have said that they're not interested in having a tap room. That's fine. But those who do, let's give them an opportunity. So that's why I've put forward those amendments. My 208 days are based on the fact that 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. is not financially viable for these tap rooms. The Minister brings forward Amendment 25, and we have then Amendment 28. Then we have two days a week, 11 to 11. And I think that's a fair move forward. As I said, look how amazing Bush Mills is. If we allow our producers to generate an income, then they can be more sustainable. I'd ask us all to think about the limitations we are placing on a tap room. A tap room is not a pub. They can only sell their own alcoholic drinks. And Mr Wells had pointed out, how can we prove that this is their own drink? They're only allowed to sell it with the container that it comes with. You know, it's, it's there. It's spelled out, actually. We discussed this through the committee stages. 
If you walk into a brewery and you see someone drinking gin, that's blatantly obvious that it's not something that has been brewed in that local producer's um, brewery. They are not like a pub that is free to sell a range of beers, wines, spirits and, and ciders. Pubs can have late licences. These producers won't. We wouldn't limit a cheesemaker or any other artisan food producer in this way, so why are we doing it to the producers of alcohol drinks? In Group 2, we also have the amendment that has been put forward by Claire Sugden that expands the definition for cinemas. Um, to be honest, Alliance is happy to support that. During the committee stage, like others have said, we were happy to support that. We recognise that the Minister has given assurances that she's going to complete um, a consultation over the summer period. Part of me thinks that we're just delaying the inevitable. Um, we have QFT, for instance, that do, does provide alcohol on premises. They don't provide it during the film festival whenever there's children's films on. So cinema goer or cinema managers are very careful with their offer, and not all cinemas have to apply for this. We may have different um, providers of cinemas that say, no, that's not for us, but why are we denying others? Unfortunately, from the signs of things, it doesn't sound like your amendment is going to pass, Ms Sugden. So then I turn to the Minister and I say the same as Mr Allen has said. In your summary, it would be really good, Minister, if you can confirm that you will bring forward the consultation for the ability of cinemas to sell, cinem to sell alcohol if they so apply. Thank you. I call Alex Easton. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I intend to speak on Amendments 7, 9, 15, 33, 34, and 61. The second group of amendments deals with two main ideas, cinemas and local producers, and so I will deal with cinemas briefly before moving on to the taproom issue. On Amendment 7, I was enabled to support the idea of cinemas being classified as places of public entertainment so that they could become licensed without a prior public consultation. It is my view that Northern Ireland does not have a great deal of entertainment options for those who do, do not like to drink uh, alcohol or do not like to be in the presence of those that do. There are therefore a significant number of questions surrounding the sale of alcohol in cinemas, such as whether it would only be available to purchase after a certain time or only in certain screenings. There would be obvious implications for families, children, teenagers and those who simply wish to have an alcohol-free experience at the cinema. We also have to consider the implications for cinema staff. In light of these concerns and having great respect for those opposed to this development, I welcome the Minister's commitment to a public consultation on the topic over the summer. I support the Committee's ultimate decision to withhold support on Amendment 7 until this public consultation has been completed and we have a greater understanding of that impact of this change. And, and just to say to Ms Sogden, um, it's, it's not that I'm not open-minded, I am, but I, I really need the Minister to make sure that this consultation happens. And um, depending on what that actually says would depend on me being more open minded or not. <laughs> so I hope that explains that. Mr Deputy Speaker, Amendment nine. Um, the committee chairs already outlined the uh, extension deliberations carried out by the committee regarding tap rooms and local producers, and so I will not repeat at length the depth of work that has gone into these issues. I will only say that this is an area which has needed attention for a number of years and that it would have been preferable to have more research on the topic available when this was being considered at committee. I therefore echo the comments of the committee chair and welcome the commitment from the Department for Communities to make up a report on tap rooms if this proves to be necessary. I have been supportive of the majority view on the committee regarding these issues and I will support Amendment 9, which allows for breweries to showcase more of their products to those on tour. This amendment will increase the number of samples permitted from one to four and also provides the power in secondary legislation to alter this number if necessary. I am also supportive of the consequential amendments, including Amendment 15, which contains the definition of a tour when it comes to local producers. Of course, the Bill does balance out this development by restricting the time during which these samples can be provided to between the hours of 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. The Committee was divided on new clause 8a, but as I said before, this is an amendment which I support. It will enable local producers to take advantage of Operation Tap Rooms for up to 104 days in a year. During the limited hours of 4 p.m. to 10 p.m., 
The bill further seeks to provide balance on this issue by limiting the alcohol available for consumption so to that which is produced in the brewery in question. I understand the concerns of the hospitality sector regarding the issue of competition. However, this must be balanced out with the benefits of these changes to our tourism sector. The evidence that the committee examined showed us uh, that where tap rooms exist, there is a boost to the local economy and popular with tourists that visit these breweries. Given the struggle that the tourism industry has faced during this pandemic and the ongoing uncertainty surrounding the return of international travel, it is of great importance that we do all we can to support this sector. Finally, I would like to add that I agreed with the committee view that those with taproom licences should have restrictions placed on their access to occasional licences. As a result, I support amendments 33 and consequential amendments 34 and 61. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sir Pat Catney, Hon Kainch, I call Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I suppose um, I really wasn't going to try and say too much because I didn't want to try and influence, but I've seen the way the debate goes. Uh, it's maybe only 20, 25 years ago where Northern Ireland was, was a complete drought for local cast beers. Uh, I think the first uh, brewery that we had was Hilden, and uh, Seamus and Anne Scullion opened that up. I myself used to go to um, to Wales to buy a beer in uh, Cardiff called Brains, uh, the brewery in Brains, to buy uh, a beer called Brains. So I went out to Wales to bring Brains back to Belfast, and they would have been glad of getting some real, like traditional Guinness, even though it was slightly pasteurised. Look, there is a reason for all of this, and the ties to public houses, because of the expense and because of the trouble publicans find themselves going to certain large houses. In my main time it was Bass and Guinness, if I'm allowed to say them, and they found themselves tying their premises there to it. But look, we're very lucky. Uh, it's moved on, and uh, I believe that there is room, and I welcome the changes in th th that were here. Uh, despite the distraction of ministerial appointments today, it is a good day. Today is a day when we take another step forward and finally modernise our outdated and, frankly, arcade licensing laws. It cannot come soon enough. Prior to COVID, we were losing 100 pubs a decade, and the commercial viability of the industry was already under pressure due to rising costs and the lack of opportunity to increase consumer numbers. Market share and trying to attract tourists. But since COVID, there are a huge number of our pubs, as well as members of our entire hospitality sector, that now may not survive. When we look above the doors of our pubs, we see the names of those small owners. And they're so proud to have their names there. And it, it says, licensed to sell alcohol, either on or off the premises. Do you know, folks? Contrary to what people might think, my days in the bar, it was very rare to see a drunk person because I firmly believe with the pricing and the structure and the operation of good publicans, that has to be cut out. We don't want it. It's an absolute mess and the night is a long night and you have a pit in your stomach if you're trying to watch them. So that has been eradic eradicated. As I said, when we look above those doors, the business owners who have worked long hours during the hard and dirty work to give us a place to share all the joys and sorrows of our common human experience. I have been there for the long days, lugging kegs around and scrubbing floors, even on the low days when you don't know if enough punters would come through the door to keep your business afloat. I don't want to go on about that ring of steel that surrounded Belfast, but we had to operate with all sorts of pressures there. And I can tell you, those people that made it from the Shankill Road or the Falls Road and made their way into Belfast. They're the people that kept this city open, folks. They wanted to get into a neutral environment, and they made that way down. And the publicans were glad in order in the city centre in order to try and get that business. When I think of the experience I've been able to share with so many people, through all the happy announcements, new births, marriages, new jobs, new opportunities, I've seen people from across our whole community 
who would never have come together normally, share a pint and talk about how all of us politicians are no good and doing nothing. That's only a joke, folks, of course. That was before I uh, came into politics. Uh, I've also commiserated with friends in the hard times, the times of loss, of hardship and of having no one to turn to. Pub owners are family, but once you open a pub, that family extends to all the patrons that pay you the compliment of crossing your doors. This is the human element that we must support, and in doing so, we support Northern Ireland as a whole. Pubs alone provide over $200 million to our economy. This grows when you add in your local breweries and distilleries that are growing by day and producing award-winning beers and whiskies. In my own area, in Lagan Valley and in County Down, we have a fantastic Hillary Brewery, the oldest independent brewery in Northern Ireland. We have the incredible facility of Hinch Whiskey with Aaron and the team distilling some excellent whiskies and being part of the County Down revival with the country quickly becoming the county, becoming the distillation hotspot of Ireland, along with Inchville, Copeland and the small but mighty Killowen. The extension to open hours, particularly around Easter, are small but necessary. Changes that allow these small family businesses to operate in the modern world and I hope no one can come after me now, but I have to confess to you, I hate to tell you, but I'm going to anyhow, it was unnecessary. Eastern restrictions were never that effective, at least in my day. Sometimes the old knock on the door was maybe the best pint, but there you go. This is not about allowing unrestricted drinking. As I have said before, pub owners are smart business people, and there's nothing worse for your business than a drunk and difficult customer. We do all we can to stop it. My colleague Matthew O'Toole, and can I speak? I'm all right to speak on Matthew's amendment here. Oh, um, maybe just to advise the member, that's a, diff that's a different group. There'll be ample time to speak okay. on that. Well, so I'd suggest, suggest he come back to breweries and, and the, okay. the, that, the likes of that, which is within the scope of this group. Some of the alarming figures that show the extent of the challenge facing our hospitality businesses. But we all know how difficult it is. We all can feel it on our main streets and our high streets. Long before the pandemic, small rural pubs were disappearing from isolated communities. These communities just don't lose a local business. They just don't lose jobs or income to the area. They lose a real part of themselves because, particularly in rural, isolated communities. A pub isn't just somewhere to have a pint. It is the place where you catch up with neighbours, a place where you connect with people. It is the true sense a public house. And when I think of the money we have spent in these places and across our society trying to create community hubs or spaces to fulfil the needs of our, the contact between people in our communities, it is honestly mad that we are presiding over policies that are killing off pubs that fulfil that exact need for so many. That is why I welcome my colleagues' modest proposals for a review of the licensing system. I commend the Minister. Um, we're, we're actually straying into okay, Group 4 again there, Mr Catney. No one can uh, say that the current model is working as well as it should for business, as it isn't working within our communities. Mr Speaker, this is the start of our modernising our licensed laws of supporting a key part of our economy and supporting the many small family businesses at the heart of all our communities. Pubs are not easy, folks. They're absolutely. <laughs> I can't stop laughing over here. I thank the member for giving way. And I really do enjoy the passion with which he speaks on this subject and so many more. And I totally agree with him on so much of what he said. I can't believe for a second that you would ever have knocked on the door and let anyone do so, but it does feel like we're probably in for a lock-in tonight, and just to keep that going. Um, do you agree with me, though, and I do with yourself, in terms of the, the pride and passion with which these entrepreneurs in Northern Ireland are producing these wares in terms of our local brewers? And it has been a shame that up to now so many have been selling so much more outside Northern Ireland than actually the in Northern Ireland because of the restrictive rules. But there are some concerns among the actual wet pub industry that this is going to impact the trade. Do you agree with me that due to the great work of the committee, that the research has been put into that, that we have struck the balance now? Well, I, I, I do agree with you, and I think that there is room 
for, for the brewers and for our new distillers as well. They add to what we have to offer here. I mean, there's no point in going to a marketplace and only having one stall. You need lots of different things to be there. And to go back to what Kelly was, uh, sorry, um, my colleague from um, um, uh, Hollywood, <laughs> Andrew, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> he's putting stop it. But, but look, we have the brewers, and the brewers do beer. They don't do anything else but beer. And then we have the distillation who do the whiskies or the gins. And it is, I don't want to, if any of you get a chance, even if you don't drink, go and have a look at Hinch. It's a brand new setup. I know. Uh, I'm straight off slightly there, but yes, I do agree with you. And we have some great products. And whenever I went into the bar first, it was an apprenticeship, folks. It was five years, it was slave labour. But I had the best opportunity to work with some of the best bar people that this place ever produced. And from the bar, and from the selling of those bars, or from the, or from the distillers, or from the, uh, the breweries, they're, they're the first face that our tourists see when they come here. They're the first face of entertainment, where to go to or how to do it. Uh, I see that, as I say, I, I'm up here and I do support the changes and I do hope, not all of them of course, but you know, I do hope that it's the start of a long journey and we help and modernise and look at what the hospitality of the drinks business has done to Northern Ireland, absolutely again. <laughs> could, could, would the honourable member accept from me as a strict teetotaler who doesn't allow intoxicating liquor ever to cross his lips that I've learnt more about the licensing trade in the last 15 minutes than I've learnt in the last six, 64 years? And does it not show that when the member departs from his prepared script and speaks with passion about something he has a detailed knowledge about, it is extremely easy on the ear? Thank you. Uh, my colleague, I know he might represent uh, out there in South Down, but he's a Moira man at heart, and I, I, I know well. And I worked on that little four trees in Moira. With, with, look, it's together, folks, that we build. If we're seriously thinking about having a world-class tourist uh, to invite people here, we need to make these changes. All right, we need to be doing it, and we need to stop looking down our noses at publicans or at small brewers. We need to think of what they're doing and how they're driving this place on, as I've said. I, I mean, I have so many people that I can see that make their way, that made their way down, as I've said, that shanker on the Falls Road. But we need to cherish that, and we need to cherish the offering what we have. So I accept what, what the ministers are trying to do as best as possibly can. Thank you. And thank you too. Um, could I now call Rachel Woods uh, so follow with that, Ms Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I've just written down here quickly, I don't know how I can follow that submission by Mr Catney, but I can't agree more. As he'll know, we share a passion for this industry. Um, many years slogging my guts out behind a bar, cleaning the floors, cleaning up after people, serving pints and so on. But to Group 2, um, Members will have all received briefings and no doubt been lobbied extensively on local producers' licences, and rightly so, and this is part of Group 2. And it's caused considerable debate from a number of sides and a number, there are well, a number of well-rehearsed issues that many members have already spoken to, either at second stage or tonight, during the debate. And I want to reiterate comments made by Ms Armstrong earlier on. Tap rooms and pubs are far from one and the same thing. Um, people do not go to them for the same reasons, and having been to many of both, I can completely attest to that. And also, why would a local producer want to sell somebody else's product? This was brought up by Mr. Wells in relation to enforcement. They are the manufacturer of their own product. Why would they want to sell somebody else's product that is available elsewhere? I will give way. Let's take the example of Ms. Ms. Armstrong, who actually represents Newton Arts, not Antrim or anywhere else. And Ms. Armstrong made the point that uh, the tap rooms are no threat to the licensed trade. But let's take the example of Bush Mills, for instance, where you've got Bush Mills Distillery, which accepts the oldest distillery in the world and a leading tourist attraction. There's also Bush Mills Inn. 
Now, if tourists can go to Bushmills Distillery and avail of the product in the tap room for the large number of days pr uh, promoted by Mrs. Kelly, Mrs. Ke Mrs. Armstrong, inevitably they will not be going to the Bushmills Inn down the street. They'll be staying in the tap room. And meanwhile, the Bushmills Inn will be paying horrendous rates and a, 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 a costs which the distillery will not be having to, having to do. So therefore, it is unfair to deprive the licensed trade by having tap rooms open for 200, is it 208 days a year. Um, I thank the member for his comments. I afraid I don't agree with Mr. Wells on that. And just from my own experience, um, if I was going to a tap room that was open to 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, let's first say, for example, I'm going to go then, me personally, I'm going to go onto a bar afterwards, especially if it was connected to or in the same town as said distillery or tap room. Um, I'm going to enjoy my night out. I'm free to do so. I do not see the tap rooms and bars being in direct competition with each other. Indeed, I see them actually to complement each other. And I use the example in my own constituency of how good Copeland has been to the local town of Donica Dee. And I wish them all the best in their, um, in their, in their, them exploring to get their licences. But I'll be on to some issues that um, have been brought up. I will give way. The member for Gibbon Wales, just on the issue that Mr. Wells brought up in, in relation to Bush Mills, uh, Bush Mills actually own a full uh, pub licence. They could open full pub bars if they chose to, but they, cho they choose not to. So I think as part of this as well, we need to understand that there will be many brewers out, bre breweries, cideries, distilleries out there that will choose not to also um, avail of, of a tap room licence. And we can see that of how Bush Mills actually, of how they, have, uh, how they operate, that they actually complement each other in that tourism model. Um, um, so that, and that's very much the hope within the, the tap rooms, how they will complement um, their local bars. And I know, I know you're going on to speak about it, but Copeland, certainly when they come in to brief us, was one of those um, local distilleries. Um, on, the, on Strangford that very much does complement their local areas. Thank the member for intervention. I think this reiterates then the need to have choice in this bill and this legislation. And not everyone will go to the limits allowed, but they'll go for what suits them and their local area. And I don't know of any local brewery or distillery that would want to jeopardise their local community, the fact that they're inherent parts of their local community. But again, I will go on to that later on when I talk about pub is the hub. So I'm not going to go into all the amendments on this group. Many of them are technical and have been discussed and covered already, but I do wish to draw attention to a number of the potential issues that um, appear to me, and I'm very, very happy to be proved wrong. Um, that could actually be the unintended consequences that members did uh, discuss earlier on but did not actually go into detail of. And this is in relation to new clause 8A and amendment numbers 19 and 23. And specifically, I hope to get the issues addressed and some answers. Members will be aware from Cameras briefing they stated that similar legislation on uh, local producers, licences and tap rooms was introduced in the Republic of Ireland several years ago and there had been virtually no take-up in the ability to run a tap room or offer premises tours. And it's my understanding that it is low as, as one or two out of the 70 plus breweries and local producers in the Republic of Ireland. And when I asked a few people why they thought this was the case, was it, say, administrative burden, was it financial burden, or was maybe there just no appetite amongst the local producers, for example? It was a bit of a mix, but there were diffi the, the biggest issue was difficulty in getting planning permission and the restrictions on opening hours. And I know we're dealing with that in a number of amendments in terms of opening hours in this group. Um, Camera stated that the requirement to attain planning permission to operate within restricted opening hours meant that it was not worthwhile for small independent businesses to do so. And they argued that we need to make sure that the bill does not end up being unworkable in practice due to onerous restriction. And I'm sure the committee members would agree with me of all the hours they spent on this, that they would not want a, something on the face of the bill that was actually unworkable for the very people that they were trying to do something for. So, to put it bluntly, the main thing here is we need clarification on the producer's licence and how it will work in practice, how it will be interpreted, uh, interpreted in the courts, as this will have consequences for those who try and get one. As mentioned above, Camera have already said in relation to the uptake of licences in the Republic of Ireland, as well as what it would mean for the local producer here. And I'm going to use a real-life example here with regard to planning permission. Um, so we have a local producer, a brewery, 95% of that brewery floor space, 
floor, floor space sorry, is used for manufacturing during the week. But at the weekend, they put out some temporary seating in an area that normally is used to hold stock. They then would be using the area for manufacturing purposes from Monday to Friday, and then using it to sell beer as part of a tap room license on Fridays and Saturdays. And that's through the tap room allowed under the local producer's license for the nights that they are allowed, during the times that they are allowed, under the license agreement. The floor space dedicated to the tap room is therefore temporary. Perhaps it could be described as ancillary to the main purpose of the building, which is manufacturing. Maybe the minister will be able to clarify that in terms of the local producer's license. If it's ancillary, in Great Britain, no planning permission would be required. Yet in our bill here, and it's been mentioned about suitability of premises, planning permission is required. Now, on to another problem in relation to planning permission and lack of clarity. How are LPS going to rate them? Licensed premises are rated on the receipts and expenditure method. And I cannot speak for all local producers, but those who I have spoken to have said that they would be happy to be rated on the basis for the tap rooms and the retail that they do, but not for the whole manufacturing premises as a whole. And perhaps rightly, why should they lose their industrial D rating for an ancillary part of their business? Maybe this has already been figured out. Maybe there's an easy answer to it. And learning from the experiences in England and the Republic of Ireland, could the rating be decoupled? Like, for example, we have for some manufacturing businesses like printers. They are operating as manufacturers on their premises, but their front-facing section is only part of their business, so it's still industrially derated. Again, if the brewery floor space is used for manufacturing, but there is also a dedicated and permanent floor space and furniture and so on there for the taproom event, then different decisions could be made. But this is not clear. This is not in the amendments, and it's certainly not in the explanatory or financial memorandum, and it has not been discussed on the floor this evening. We do not want to get to a point where much work has been done, as I said, many hours have been spent for the license criteria within this bill and the amendments that we're debating tonight with the operational guidance, which I welcome that will be coming from the department, we'll discuss that in a later group, and the regulations mean that it's actually unworkable for those people and the businesses that it is designed for, namely the local producers. So to the occasional licenses, I would welcome, um, I welcome I'm happy to take an intervention again from the Minister or anyone on Amendment Numbers 33 and 34 with regard to the occasional licences, which are being on Clause 18. If there's any clarification of this amendment, means that those with local producers cannot apply for occasional licences, for example, at a local festival. As I've had representation made to me about matters in relation to occasional licences, and it would be helpful to know exactly what this clause, amendment does and does not do. And also, why is this amendment here? Why would, we, why would we stop local producers from being able to apply for an occasional licence? I do not see any reasoning, again, outlined in any of the speeches today. So I'll now turn to Amendment 29, which is one in my name. And I submitted this amendment on the same day as Ms Armstrong, and I too thank uh, Claire for her assistance in this, uh, especially at such late notice. And from the outset, I am also happy to support the amendment made in Ms Armstrong's name. And it's a very plain and simple amendment, which is to make, make change the opening hours allowed for local producers' licences under new clause 8A proposed by the committee. And the reason why I tabled this amendment to the opening hours, much like Ms Armstrong, is to try and make it more financially viable for local producers to create new jobs and increase investment. Under the committee amendment, which the opening times would be six hours a day from four to ten, I view as overly restrictive with no clear rationale for, because I do not see the direct competition between pubs and bars to tap rooms. This would not make local producers into pubs by another name. It am the amendment only allows for an extension to opening hours, as in the committee amendment 8A. Members will know if they've been to a tap room that these are not pubs, as I said. They're totally different in terms of our atmosphere and what is available. And I love a pub. I absolutely love a pub. I've grown up in pubs. I go 
I wish I was too young, Mr. Wells. Um, I go for the community, for the friends, for the good food, for the music, for the crack, and for the atmosphere, and also the history and culture. And we have such amazing pubs in Northern Ireland. But I go to tap rooms for very different reasons to try products that are not available in pubs and bars. In effect, I go for something different. And given the number of days that a tap room could operate already exists, it does not follow for me that there would be further restrictions on opening times within the clause. And these operating times, whilst I appreciate this has come from a compromise, it would seem, with the committee's deliberations, it isn't really fit for purpose and could lead to another position where we have these licences not being used. And I have read the committee report in relation to this, and I don't understand the reasoning. If the opening hours were allowed to 11, which is in line with other licences during the week, I believe that it's more of a compromise and makes local producers more financially viable, and also it makes it clear for those who are tasked with enforcement to know that everything is open to the same time. And finally, I want to mention the amendment in relation to cinemas being made in Claire Sugden's name, which is already spoken to. I note that this is something the committee did hear evidence on and consider as additional issues as part of the bill. And I've read the report, listened to the speeches this evening, and I note that the committee were content with the information that the departmental officials provided and that they would consult with the public on this matter over the summer. And pending this, there had been an agreement to reg regulations to be made relatively shortly. But perhaps, as others have done, the Minister would give us an indicative date on when this consultation will be launched. I know we've said the summer months. I believe June is the summer. And I also wish to get some clarification, hopefully, if I can, from the Minister. How does a venue become designated as a place of public entertainment normally? Is it up to the Department to decide? And when previous venues have been added before, has there been public consultation done? And I'm sure we can nearly all tell stories about people smuggling in alcohol to places that shouldn't or weren't allowed, as Mr. Durkin had brought up earlier on, but maybe that's for another time. But fundamentally, if cinemas don't want to serve alcohol, and if they took that decision not to have alcohol present, then that decision can still be taken by them. And there is no one forcing a cinema to stock or sell it. It's merely an option, and I bring it back to having choice in this legislation. So those are my issues and the questions, and I would welcome an answer to most of them, if not all of them, in more detail. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Now she him, Sir Jerry Carroll, on Kanchai. I call S Jerry Carroll. Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, Mr. Catney said he hasn't been in uh, a pub with any drunk people. I think, and uh, I said he must be in some core establishment over the years. But uh, I think uh, that was an interesting comment, obviously, uh, by him. Sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, what I tried to say to you was that the day of the drug man in the public house is finished, simply because of, of where we are with alcohol and the professionalism of our bar staff and of, of our public. And because the last thing you want, or anyone wants, Mr. Speaker, is a drunk man on your premises. Okay. Well, <laughs> Um, I wasn't trying to make light of his comments, but you know, obviously there's a wider issue about drunk people being in pubs, and that's my experience. But you know, back to the matter at hand, I suppose. Uh, and I'll keep this. Uh, well, uh, don't uh, attack West Belfast, Mr. Catney. Um, just to keep this uh, issue <laughs> brief, because I'll be supporting all amendments and clauses in this group, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, only want to put on record our support, my party's support. Um, for those who continue to challenge the monopolies in this sector, those who have fought to give small local uh, producers a look in, while a lobby of you know, mostly big businesses try to shut them out for fear, uh, misconception maybe, that it would eat into their profits. Uh, this place, uh, the Assembly and the Executive, puts a lot of stock in tourism. And in, the, in doing so, boasts of the production of local crafts, uh, craft beers and ales, and I personally think that some of the locally produced uh, bottles are fantastic and uh, outstanding, but it's entirely hypocritical uh, to attract tourists with the premise, the promise rather, of unique produce, uh, whilst prohibiting uh, the producers from selling their beers unless it's through a third-party vendor. So I think breweries and microbreweries should avail of tap rooms if they wish, so they can reap uh, as well the benefits of what they sow, and people can enjoy their produce right at the source. Uh, and of course, uh, I want to thank everybody for raising this issue and the many, many people who contacted me on this. So, like I said, I'll be brief, Mr. Deputy Speaker, but just want to uh, speak in support of all the amendments uh, and clauses in Group Two.
Agus Anish, Adam Sir Ira Nabubble, Deirdre Harger, Hong Kai Chagas, Fragra Horch, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargi, to respond. Thanks very much, and thanks very much for everybody for the contributions um, that you've made and, and even amendments that have been placed. And I don't know about anybody else, but when we finally get through this legislation in whatever form it takes, I'm going for a pint with Pat Ketney, um for the crack, so anybody else can join us. Jim, you can have tea if you want. It doesn't need to be alcohol. Um, but again, just getting back to um, issues raised in the debate, and obviously in terms of amendment uh, seven tabled by Claire Sugden. Um, to introduce, this would introduce a new clause to 7A, places of specific entertainment inclusion of cinemas to the bill. This would add cinemas to the list of venues which are defined as a place of public entertainment under Article 2 of the Licence and Order and therefore eligible to apply for a licence to sell alcohol on the premises. In discussions with the committee on the issue, officials from my department made clear concerns regarding an amendment allowing in pre uh, sorry, primary legislation drink to be sold in cinemas without public consultations. And we know we have listened to some tonight, but also externally arguments have been made um, that there are few entertainment options for families or people who prefer not to be in the company of those consuming alcohol or in the presence of alcohol itself. There is the potential also for wider public and indeed the wider cinema sector, staff, etc., to hold very strong views on the issue one way or the other. Um, and I do feel that there is a need to consult on this issue. There's been no public consultation or impact assessments that have been carried out on the amendment, and that would result in a change to the licensing order itself. The amendment would be irreversible um, if there were to be any unintended consequences, and that's also a concern. Legal advice has confirmed that cinemas could be included in the definition of place of public entertainment by means of regulations, and I've therefore agreed with the committee that my department carries out a short, focused public consultation exercise. I have given commitments, and indeed commitments that I've given previously to the committee. Um, I have lived up to, so there's no abdication for me in terms of those commitments that I give. And indeed, preparatory work is already well underway in terms of that consultation, and we will see that issue in, in early July. So, in the next couple of weeks, that consultation will be brought forward. So, just to give clarity on that. And considering the responses to the consultation and subject to no serious concerns being raised, regulations will be brought to this Assembly in the autumn. For this reason, I do not support this amendment. Moving on, although I can understand the reasons for bringing it. So are you looking? Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Minister. I suppose to, um, to kind of come to the point that Ms. Woods made in relation to the provision that you, you already have in, in being able to, to uh, grant this under a public entertainment, can you confirm um, through legal advice that it is a normal practice that you would uh, conduct a period of public consultation in, in moving toward that regulation? Well, just in terms of I mean, the legal advice that we've sought um, in terms of this issue, it is important. Um, by not taking the amendment now that we do consult further on this issue. Um, and as laid out, I have said um, that I will be doing that in the next number of weeks, that that consultation will be issued and that the regulations then can be changed. Um, I think also in terms of moving the amendments in relation to local producers, which are provided for in Clause 8, the committee was concerned about the number of samples uh, which a local producer could provide particularly given local producers will have a range of products to offer and has been tabled um, amendment number eight on the issue. I am proposing an alternative amendment number nine that will allow for the maximum amount of alcohol which could be provided to any one person, whether in one serving or more than one serving. Amendment 10 tabled by the chair of the committee inserts a new paragraph in Article 42 of the Licensing Order, which provides for the permitted hours of licensed premises. The amendment provides for permitted hours for the provision of samples and measures at local producer premises as being between 10 in the morning and 7 in the evening. In Clause 8, as introduced, the provisions of samples following a tour of local producer premises can take place at any time during the permitted off-sale hours of 8 a.m. to 11 p.m. 
I do not believe that there is a need to restrict the provision of samples to between 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. If tours take place later in the evening for a visiting group of tourists in the summer months, for example, the ability to offer samples as an inducement to the sale would be taken away. I therefore do not support this amendment and subsequent amendments number 11 and 12, which relate to this amendment. Amendment 13 is a technical amendment to improve the drafting of the bill should amendment 19 be passed. The committee amendment number 14 defines a tour for the purposes of a person receiving a sample or measure. The bill drafts person have considered the amendment and believes it is unnecessary. The advice received is that the only reason for defining an ordinary uh, word in the legislation is to give it special meaning. That is narrower or broader than the natural meaning. Should the amendment pass, however, there will be a need for a corrected amendment, and for that reason I am proposing amendment number 15. Amendment number 16 is a consequential amendment to ensure the policy of clause 8 of the bill is achieved. The committee amendments number 17 and 18 are consequential to the amendment number 8, adding the offence to the list of those which attract penalty points. Amendment number 19 tabled by the Chair of the Committee is a significant divergence from the policy previously agreed by the Executive. The amendment permits the sale of alcohol for consumption on local producer premises. The amendment will allow a local producer to apply to the court for a suitability order as part of its premises for sale of alcohol consumption on the premises. And following the grant of such an order, the amendment will allow the local producer to apply for an authorisation to sell alcohol produced at the premises to be sold for consumption on the premises between 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. I have some concern about this amendment due to the fact that there have been no consultation, no impact assessments or screening exercises carried out. This is a fundamental change to the licensing system, and I would caution against making such a change by an amendment to a bill. The impact of such an amendment is unknown, and given the significant investment by many licence holders have been made to their businesses, allowing in effect a mini pub in local producers' premises may have an adverse impact on local pubs, particularly small rural pubs in the vicinity of a local producer's premises, which could end up in direct competition. The overheads for local producers uh, will be less than for the pub. And a local producer will not have to prove that the number of similar premises in the vicinity is inadequate, which a pub is required to do when applying for the licence. This could result in a number of uh, mini pubs being allowed to operate in local producers' premises in close proximity to each other. The committee and I believe members in their own constituencies have received uh, a number of representations from licence holders asking that such an amendment not be taken forward for what I expect to be uh, the same reasons. There is also a concern in respect to the potential negative impact on health, both in the short and long term. Evidence shows that there is a link between increasing the availability of alcohol with increased consumption and increased consumption with increased levels of alcohol-related harm. The strength of the alcohol produced in local producer premises has also been raised, a potential, has also been raised as a potential health concern given it is often much stronger than other beers and ales. I do not support this amendment. Sorry, yes, go on. That, uh, by their very nature, uh, these premises produce high-strength alcohol. Uh, and really what is likely to happen is those that, who do avail of this uh, opportunity will, will we drink to a stage where they are kind of say, quite happy. And therefore, it is highly unlikely they will go on to afterwards to licensed premises a, because they probably will have, have had enough uh, and have spent a fair bit, but also because they may well have reached the level where they wouldn't be admitted to licensed premises afterwards. So, therefore, the point that Mrs. Mrs. Woods, who I still don't believe is old enough to be availing of any of these premises, but Mrs. Woods' point is, is invalid that there will be no benefit to licensed premises, who, once again, I emphasise, are paying horrendous rates at the moment for the service they, they provide. Sure. Well. Do you want me to respond to that first? Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Minister. Yes. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I think 
all of these issues. That's why we need to take more consideration in looking at the issue. I mean, I do recognise that there are concerns. We have moved somewhat with this bill um, in terms of providing additional allowances for microbreweries um, in order to sell their products, to go to furs to do the products as well, and to have tours. But in recognising some of those concerns that may be raised, we need to do more work to scope that out, and that's what I would be asking for within this. Sorry, I think Kelly's that. Yeah. And I appreciate your time in this matter. Um, Minister, you said yourself there hasn't been consultation, but there seems to be an awful lot of negative impacts coming out of local producers. I would just ask if you could clarify where is the consultation that has identified those negative impacts, because I am concerned that there is a, an opinion coming forward that local producers are all bad um, and there's something wrong with them and they will always harm pubs whenever my experience actually is that they complement so strongly and so well with local rural pubs? Well, I think in terms of local brewers, I mean, they make a, they make a good contribution to um, this sector, obviously in terms of the wider tourism sector as well. It's an increasing phenomenon in terms of microbreweries and pubs over recent years as well, and obviously the existing legislation has never reflected that. That's why there have been amendments that I am putting forward in terms of working with that sector um, who are committed, who are passionate about what they are delivering, and I obviously want to continue to work with them in the time ahead. But any major change in terms of legislation, I do believe, and in seeking the advice um, around these issues, that we do need to consult further. And I do believe on this issue, in terms of the issue of fairness that has been raised by some members, and also other considerations or concerns that have been raised um, as well, also need to be considered as part of that consultation. And I am willing to work with the sector um, and with the community more widely as we move through that as well. And should members decide that the Committee's Amendment No. 19 stands as part of the Bill, I have tabled a number of mainly technical and correctional amendments, numbers 28, sorry, 20 to 28 to Amendment 19, which ensure a consistent approach through the, the, the licence in order and which will improve the enforceability of the provisions. I therefore do not wish to prolong the debate by commencing commenting on each of the amendments individually. Amendment number 28, tabled by um, Kelly Armstrong, proposes to amend the committee amendment number 19, introducing a new clause 8A um, in terms of sales and consumption on premises. Uh, Kelly's amendment proposes that the permitted hours for such premises should be changed uh, from 4 uh, in the afternoon to 10 in the evening from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. I do not support amendment uh, number 19 and therefore do not support Kelly's proposed amendment. Amendment number 29 is tabled by Rachel Woods also proposes to amend the committee amendment number 19 to effect that the permitted hours of local producer premises should be changed from 4 in the afternoon um, to 10 in the evening to 12 um, in the afternoon to 11 in the evening. As for amendment number 28, I do not support this amendment. Amendment numbers 30 uh, to 32 are again technical and correctional amendments to number 19, which I have tabled to ensure a consistent approach throughout the bill. And I again will be uh, not prolong the debate in terms of going through those individually. Amendment number 33, tabled by the Chair of the Committee, introduces a new clause 8b, which inserts a restriction to prohibit an occasional licence from being granted for a place licensed um, as a local producer's premises, which I also, in receipt of a uh, suitability order, to sell alcohol for consumption on the premises. I do not support this amendment, however, should amendment number 33 be passed. I propose a correcting amendment number 34 to improve the drafting and to ensure it is compatible with current licensing order. My proposed amendment number 61 is simply an update to the text of Schedule 1 to the Bill and is necessary if amendment, amendment number 19 is passed. Thank you. And I call Ms Claire Sugden to wind. 
Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, in, in winding, I don't intend to reiterate um, every point made by every member, but what I will do is maybe pick out some of the key points that I think are interesting and see if there's a way if we can take any of those uh, forward. Um, I, I will begin where I started in terms of my own uh, amendment, and I will say that I am disappointed that I think it is unlikely that it will get support. I'm disappointed, not least, because most of the members who contributed uh, to the debate around that particular amendment have indicated their support. Um, I do share similar concerns to Mr. Mr. Durkin, in that I, I have a nervousness around this not being taken to where it is hoped by other members in the autumn. Certainly, in the minister's contribution, um, she, did, she does seem to be leaning towards not uh, uh, putting these regulations. But I do appreciate that she um, has put on record today; she has put it in writing to the committee um, that she will have a public consultation, and it does seem that that's progressing already. And hopefully, will will we'll find its way in the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, but again, I agree with Ms. Um, Armstrong on that and saying that we are delaying the inevitable here. And given the challenges presented by some members in terms of uh, cinemas in particular, not least um, because of the pandemic, but also the, the ongoing challenges in relation to streaming services, I really do think there is an opportunity here for them to develop a business model here which goes beyond just providing alcohol in, in, in theatres. Customers you know, are telling me that that is what they want. I do think it can happen within a, a, a safe space. With a, a, I think it's fine within a family environment. If anything, it's probably the safest space. Um, you know, there are arguments about this is the last family-friendly space, but why should that be the burden of cinemas? You know, so I, I think we, we need to be very careful in and around uh, languages ar uh, around that. Um, just to come to the other amendments, I think Rachel Woods um, raised some very interesting points, and I. Uh, yes, sir. The, 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 the member's amendment has given us. Uh, maybe the best one-liner in this House for many years from Mr Durkin, which will be widely, widely uh, uh, publicised. But she said, why should it be cinemas? Because there can be no other industry in Northern Ireland that specialises more in providing entertainment for children and families. Now, I, I've taken my grandchildren to Toy Story and, and other similar films. I would prefer that I'd be guaranteed when I do that that they will not be exposed to the consumption of alcohol because they'll not be exposed to it anywhere else. They'll not be sitting in pubs. Uh, they'll not be sitting in clubs. So why should they uh, not have an alcohol-free environment? And he, she makes the point that not every cinema will wish to avail of that. But the point is, cinemas will be forced to, to take a licence if their competitors are offering the facility. I don't believe that to be the case. And indeed, speaking with the industry, their suggestion that not every cinema will want to take it. I reviewed the cinemas across Northern Ireland, and there are some cinemas that the, the, the product that they are offering um, through the chair is, um, is not conducive to providing that licence. And, and I, I suppose there is an expectation set, not least by other regions of the United Kingdom and the Republic of Ireland, where this is already being offered. And it's Northern Ireland that is, is the exception to the rule, if you like. So I, I, I do think that. I appreciate the concerns raised. I appreciate the, the concerns around the family environment. And, and whilst you maybe don't want to be in an environment where there's alcohol, there are people who do want to be in that environment and they do want to, to watch that cinema. So I, I think it is about providing a balance. But that's not to say that there aren't public health concerns. But I don't think they are. Uh, I, I think they're disproportionate to the fact that we're not doing this now. Yeah, sure. Well, much has been said about this being the last sector of our society for children's entertainment that's not got alcohol involved in it, and I think that is somewhat of a stretch. Um, there are vast areas for children's entertainment um, that are not just cinemas that, that don't involve alcohol outside, parks, forest parks, going for walks, soft play areas in my constituency, picky fun park. Uh, bigging that up, um, or maybe the swimming pool with a leisure centre, or going to youth clubs, or enga engaging in community venues um, and community organisations and, and networks. So I, I don't think that this is the last bastion of alcohol-free children's entertainment that it's been made out to be. Okay, uh, I thank the member for those examples, um, and I would agree with the sentiment around those. Um, you know, I. I Again, I appreciate the arguments, and I appreciate as a father and a grandfather, you know, that's certainly his wish. But I think we need to look at this in a wider context. We need to look at it in the context of Northern Ireland, both within the United Kingdom, Ireland, even the world. Um, and you know, I, I think we need to move to a place where everywhere else in 2021 is providing this service. And I think Northern Ireland just, you know, needs to bring, come up to date with that. Um, 
To, again, to move on to other notable points, um, uh, Rachel Woods, I think, made some really interesting points, and I wonder if there's any opportunity that the Minister might even consult with uh, the uh, Minister for Infrastructure, particularly around the planning permission concerns. It's, it's valid when someone makes an issue of it. They may not make an issue of it, so it might be worth even consulting with councils to, to understand if that's something that would be implemented or, you know, in most Thank cases, you. sure, yeah. Thank you for giving way. And I think we also need to get some clarity from the Minister for Finance then as well with regarding to the rating issue that I mentioned. And, and we need, also need some clarity in amendments in relation to local producers' licence and tap rooms over the requirements of planning, as you've mentioned, with the Minister for Infrastructure and Councils. But we need clarity before further consideration stage if these amendments that we're debating tonight have the unintended consequences of impacting on industrial derating, the whole ratings process, if they're ancillary, if they're temporary, because without that and without an explicit uh, mention in guidance or indeed the EFM, we, we, can't, we can't know what these unintended consequences are. Um, and we, we certainly, uh, and certainly as a member, I would welcome anyone, any, uh, put that over the committee then as well, before a further consideration stage to get this down. Otherwise, I think the member would agree with me that otherwise those hours taken by the Communities Committee would be entirely wasted if this is not accessible to local producers. I agree with the member, um, and, I, and I would like to see that fleshed out, particularly with the Department of Finance, if maybe if that's something that the, the minister would be willing to commit to. Also, mindful of the pandemic and the grants and the opportunities which went through the rating system, we could find ourselves in a situation where we have another pandemic, and grants are being provided to, to tap rooms, for example, in this instance, and they may not be eligible because the rating, you know, was done incorrectly. So, whilst it may seem a, a, a logistical argument, I think it's important one that all the work of the committee, and I do hear that from the committee. It seems to be a very extensive piece of work, and I commend them on, on, on putting their attention across, to the, uh, across this. However, their work cannot be in vain, and it needs to serve the people who have, I suppose, put their blood, sweat and tears into try and bring this, this type of uh, uh, event uh, to, to Northern Ireland. Um, see, just others as well. Um, I, I'm interested in uh, the, the rationale put forward by, by Ms Armstrong in terms of the, I suppose the calculation around you know, if this is going to be viable, because by the same token, in terms of the rating and the other uh, considerations that maybe we need to have, you know, that this is not going to be value again, uh, saying that the committee's work could be in vain if, if this isn't going to, to, to work um, for those tap rooms who want to take it forward. You know, I think the most important thing is that, you know, that we speak you know, to, to, to the industry in particular, because they, they Whenever, when, we're, when we're gone, when this receives royal assent, um, it, it's them who will be trying to make this work on the ground. So I, I, I'd be keen if, the, the, if, if others would go back and potentially consider that. Again, I, I think a lot of the, the kind of thematic words that came through um, and just listening to the various con contributions really was about the, the consideration, particularly around tap rooms. Um, and, you know, when, and when something is considered well, you know, there is a good chance that it will not get consensus because it will give rise to a number of different issues, not least from the members themselves and the committee, but also the, the various stakeholders who presented to the committee. And, and I think that is a, a sign of a good piece of work. Um, and you know, yes, I am sure there are people who, um, who who would perhaps uh, hope that we would have done more, others who would hope that we have done less. But there is balance here, and that seems to be a word that has, um, has been said through, through, throughout all contributions. And that's not to say that, you know, that we can't do something in the future. It has taken this long to get where we are now, but I think the, the important part is, is that we're here, and um, opportunities in the future maybe to, to amend this even further you know, could come up. But I think it's important that, that we have given this um, a, a good start. So I just want to thank um, every member. Yeah, go ahead. Would the member accept for me, for me that at the moment craft brewers get a 50% reduction in alcohol duty and they get industrial derailing? Meanwhile, the licence trade it don't first will pay full duty, pay 100% rates, and indeed their rates are based on their turnover, which is twice as much as an equivalent business in any other field. And would you consider those facts before she starts to place the licence trade at a further disadvantage by allowing tap rooms to expand? 
You know, I think generally, and I've listened to the members' comments throughout the evening, I don't think we're putting the licensing trade at a disadvantage simply because we're promoting another aspect of, of someone's interest in Northern Ireland. I think what we're trying to do is ensure that everybody has access to that playing field, and I don't think that's, that, that's anything that we should be worried about. I spoke earlier in the week in the Assembly, as I said in my contribution, about food tourism in Northern Ireland. There's a real opportunity with that, and tap rooms in particular. I've travelled to other parts of the world, and I've attended tap rooms, and they're absolutely fantastic. Thousands of people on a Saturday Saturday afternoon enjoying uh, uh, the local artisan product that, that is Largo. And I appreciate that this isn't perhaps the members' interest, but it is a significant interest to the people of Northern Ireland and not least to the tourists that we want to attract here. So um, I appreciate there are concerns. Those I think need to be look at, looked at in a different context, and it shouldn't be a case of what about her, because that's not how we, we, we move things forward here in Northern Ireland. Um, and, and I think, as others have said, this is a really positive, pro progressive um, piece of legislation. And I was remarking. Um, to a journalist the other day that the first iteration of this came in 2016 and despite five years of very little, you know, where we are today has actually demonstrated some sort of progression here in Northern Ireland and you know, for, for the little um, impact this mandate will have, I think this piece of legislation will be, will be a, a good take from that. So I do appreciate um, all the contributions um, uh, from everyone across the floor, in particular the committee, the department, the minister, Claire McCann. She's fantastic. She only helped me with one amendment, but the attention she gave to me I think really does um, uh, deserve the, the attention that other members have given her. And I just uh, I, I want to thank you for your attention this evening. Thank you. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. Amendment proposed after Clause 7, insert new clause, places of public entertainment, inclusion of cinemas. The question is that Amendment 7 be made and that the new clause be added to the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary, if any, no. Okay. It's a good start. Um, clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. The House will divide.
Order, order. Members will please resume their seats. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable that we could avoid a division. The question is that Amendment 7 be made and the new clause be added. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. Aye. You all sound very enthusiastic about it. Do we have tellers? Order. <clears throat> the tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Rachel Woods and Claire Sugden. Sorry, I wrote Claire Billy there. The tellers for the eyes are Rachel Woods and Claire Sugden. The tellers for the nose are Alex Easton and Jim Wells. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I would remind all members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place. I ask you to, the, to ensure that you retain at least a two-metre gap between yourself and other people when moving around in the chamber or the rotunda, and especially in the lobbies. Please be patient at all times, observe the signage, and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors.
Order. Could I ask members to resume their seat? And I'd ask the clerk now to read the result, please. 85 members voted. 49 members voted aye. 36 members voted no. The amendment is carried. The amendment has been carried. I now move on to Amendment 8, which has already been debated. And I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms Paula Bradley, to move formally Amendment number O. Oh. The chairperson isn't in the chamber. So you just take your ease for a moment, members. Take your ease for a moment. I now formally call the chairperson for the Committee for Communities, Ms Paula Bradley, to move formally Amendment No. 8. And can I ask the doorkeepers to unfasten the doors as well? Ms Bradley. Not moved. Amendment 9 has already been debated. Been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment No. 9. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 8, page 8, line 32, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 9 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will not call. I beg pardon. Amendment 10 has already been debated, and I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms. Paula Bradley, to move formally Amendment 10. Not moved. I will not call Amendment 11, as it is consequential to Amendment 10 which has not been moved. Amendment 11 has already been debated. I beg pardon. Will not call Amendment 12, as it is consequential to Amendment 11, which has not been made. Amendment 13 has already been debated and is a paving amendment to both Amendments 21 and 25. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 13. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 8, page 9, line 24, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 13 be made. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. Amendment 14 has already been debated. I call the chairperson for the Committee for Communities, Ms. Paula Bradley, to move formally Amendment 14. Not moved. Amendment 14 is not moved. I will not call Amendment 15 as it's consequential to Amendment 14, which has not been moved. Amendment 16 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 16. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 8, page 12, line 4. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 16 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. 
one moment? Certainly. Could I, uh, could I ask you to go back to Amendment 15, which is an amendment to Amendment 14 from the Minister? Um, is that not to be moved by the Minister? We have asked Claire's opinion on that. No. Members just take their ease for one moment. I'll take advice. I am advised that Amendment 15 is consequential to Amendment 14, and therefore it won't be called. Clear as mud. Okay. I won't call Amendment 17 as it is consequential to Amendment 8, which has not been made. We are now on to. Yeah. I won't call Amendment 18 as it is consequential to Amendment 10, which has not been made. Amendment. The question is the clause 8 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 19 has already been debated. I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms Paula Bradley, to move formally Amendment 19. Moved. The amendment proposed after Clause 8 insert new clause sales and consumption of liquor in local producers' premises. As Amendments 20 and 32 are amendments to 19, we need to dispose of those before returning to 19. Amendment 20 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 20. Moved. Thank you. Amendment as proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19, leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 20 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 21 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 21. Moved. Thank you. Amendment, as pro uh, sorry, amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 21 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 22 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 22. Moved. Thank you. Amendment as proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 22 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 23 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 23. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 23 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 24 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 24. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment number 24 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs> Amendment 25 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally 
Amendment 25. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 25 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yeah. I won't call 25 consequential to 21. Oh, sorry, I beg pardon. 26. Amendment 26 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 26. Moved. Amendment as proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment number 26 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 27 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to move formally Amendment number 27. Moved. Thank you. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment number 27 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 28 has already been debated. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong to move formally Amendment 28. Thank you. Moved. Thank you. Amendment 28, as, <coughs> excuse me, amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes. I would remind you that we should continue to uphold social distancing and that members who have proxy voting arrangements in place should not come to the chamber. If members wish to take their ease for just a few seconds, we're going to have a consultation with the whips about perhaps speeding up the voting process, but obviously we need to have as many parties on site for that as possible. So members just take their ease for a few seconds before we put the question. Thank you. Thank you, members. Uh, it didn't take long. I have been advised by the party whips that, in accordance with Standing Order 113.5b, that there is agreement that we can dispense with the three minutes and move straight to the division. So I now call for tellers. Do we have tellers, please?
Order. Tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the eyes are Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll. The tellers for the nose are Alex Easton and Carl McCullen. Before the Assembly divides, I want to again remind you that, as per Stanton Order 112, the Assembly currently has proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I remind all members of the requirements for social distancing while the division takes place. I ask you to ensure that you retain at least a two metre gap between yourself and other people when moving in and around the chamber or the rotunda, and especially in the lobbies. Please be patient at all times. Observe the signage and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. The question is that Amendment 28 be made. Clear the lobbies. The Assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors. Order members, can I ask members to resume their seat and can I ask the clerk to please read the result? 85 members voted, 21 members voted aye, 64 members voted no. The amendment is negatived. The amendment has been negatived. Can you please unfasten the doors? I would try and move on. Amendment 29. 
has already been debated. I call Ms Rachel Woods to move formally Amendment 29. So moved. Thank you. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. Clear the lobbies. The question will be put using the uh, fast sort of voting procedure that has been agreed by the whips. So, if I could have tellers, please, uh, to the top table. Thank you. Order, order. Before I put the question, I would again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. The question is that Amendment No. 29 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. Okay. The tellers have been appointed as follows. The tellers for the ayes are Rachel Woods and Jerry Carroll. The tellers for the no's are Alex Easton and Karen Mullen. Before the Assembly divides, I want to remind you that as per Standing Order 112, the Assembly currently has the proxy voting arrangements in place. Members who have authorised another member to vote on their behalf are not entitled to vote in person and should not enter the lobbies. I remind all members of the requirement for social distancing while the division takes place. I ask you to ensure that you retain, uh, you retain at least a two-metre gap between yourself and other people when moving around in the chamber or the rotunda, and especially in the lobbies. Please be patient at all times, observe the signage, and follow the instructions of the lobby clerks. Why do I have the feeling I'm going to be saying that tonight in my sleep? <laughs> Clear the lobbies. The assembly will divide. Eyes to my right, nose to my left.
Secure the doors. Order. Can I ask the clerk to please read the result? <clears throat> 84 members voted. 21 members voted aye. 63 members voted no. The amendment is negatived. The amendment has been negatived. Unfasten the doors. Amendment number 30 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, Formally move Amendment No. 30. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Leave out the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 30 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I will not call Amendment 31. Is it mutually exclusive with Amendment 30, which has been made? <laughs> Amendment number 32 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment number 32. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 19. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment No. 32 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Having disposed of the amendments to Amendment 19, we now return to Amendment 19.
question is that Amendment 19, as now amended, be made and the new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment number 33 has already been debated. I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms Paula Bradley, to formally move Amendment 33. Moved. Amendment proposed after Clause 8 insert new clause, restrictions on occasional licences. As Amendment 34 is an amendment to Amendment 33, we need to dispose of Amendment 34 before returning to Amendment 33. Amendment 34 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment number 34. Moved. Amendment proposed as an amendment to Amendment 33. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 34 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. We now return to Amendment 33. The question is that Amendment 33, as amended, be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 9 or 10. I propose, by leave of the Assembly, to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 9 and 10 stand part of the Bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Members, I propose, by leave of the Assembly, to suspend the sitting for 10 minutes until seven minutes past midnight. The sitting is by leave suspended.
Thank you, uh, members. Uh, we now come to the third group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 35, it will be convenient to debate amends, amendments 36 to 44, 51 to 57, and 62. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hardy, to move Amendment 35 and to address the other amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you. I beg to move Amendment number 35. Clause 11 allows courts to make an order specifying part of a premises as being suitable for an underage function. A court must be satisfied that the part of the premises is structurally adapted for the purpose of holding functions, that appropriate steps have been taken for securing the safety of under 18s, and that under 18s do not have access to other parts of the premises used for the sale of alcohol. Courts will then be able to make an authorisation for a specific function. An authorisation can specify the hours for the function, but it cannot go beyond 1 a.m. My proposed amendment number 35 allows the court, when granting an authorisation for a specific underage function, to attach conditions to that authorisation. This amendment allows the clause to operate as originally intended to safeguard the young people attending the function. The subsequent consequential amendment number 36 makes it clear that a licence holder must, who contravenes any condition relating to an underage function, is guilty of an offence. During its scrutiny of the bill, the Committee for Communities questioned whether an underage function would need to stop earlier to allow young people to be off the premises by 1 a.m. Advice sought by my officials have confirmed the current draft would mean that the licence holder was committing an offence if an under 18 uh, year old was still on the premises, albeit in the process of leaving after 1 a.m., and that this is clearly not the policy intent. I am therefore proposing Amendment No. 37, which will clarify the policy intent of the provision, allowing a young person to remain on licensed premises while in the process of leaving and or waiting to be collected. A further consequential Amendment No. 38 ensures that a relevant number of penalty points are attached to a licence where the licence holder has been found guilty of contravening any condition attached to underage functions. Clause 12 will allow a young person to remain on the licensed premises beyond 9 p.m. for a private function, provided they are accompanied by a parent or someone with parental or caring responsibility, and a substantial meal is being served. The committee deliberations on the bill included some discussion on young people who potentially do not have someone fulfilling the role of parent. And with the agreement of committee, I am proposing an amendment to number 39. They extend the provision to allow a young person to be in the company of a parent or another child attending the function. Clause 15 of the bill adds the new article to the licensing order that prohibits liquor licensing holders from selling alcoholic drinks via any unsupervised means. The committee at its evidence sessions with officials sought assurances that so-called honesty boxes were captured within these provisions. Having confirmed that the honesty boxes were captured, the drafts person of the bill advised that on reflection the clause should be redrafted. I am therefore proposing amendment numbers 40, 41, 42 and 43 at that request of the drafts person to improve the drafting of the clause and to ensure its enforceability. The committee chair has tabled an amendment number 4040 introducing new clause 17A, which places a statutory duty on the health the Department of Health to legislate for minimum unit pricing within three years of the Act coming into operation. The Minister for Health has launched a public consultation on the new substance use strategy in October last year, and the consultation closed earlier this year with the expected strategy to go to the Executive and be published in the near future. The Health Minister has publicly committed to holding a public consultation on minimum unit pricing. And that is a matter for the Department of Health, although I would like to see this brought forward as a matter of urgency. Clause 27 is similar to Clause 11 for underage functions and licensed premises, in that it allows underage functions in registered clubs. Amendment No. 51 will allow a young person to remain on the premises of a registered club while in the process of leaving or waiting to be collected. Again, with Clause 12, for licensed premises, Amendment No. 52 to Clause 28 
will allow a young person to attend a private function in a registered club with a parent or another young person who is also attending the function. Clause 29 of the Bill will allow under-18s to remain in the bar area of a sporting club up to 11 p.m. Uh, between the 1st of June and the 31st of August, and to attend one award ceremony at any time of the year. On consideration of the evidence provided to the committee, I am proposing Amendment No. 53 as extended the time period from the 1st of May to the 30th of September. This is to allow for participation in a range of evening activities that are provided by clubs. A further Amendment 54 will increase the maximum number of award ceremonies to three per year. This will also allow young people who play different levels in the same club to attend the relevant ceremonies. I am also proposing Amendment 55 to include a power that both uh, the months and number of ceremonies can be amended by regulations. This will mean that any issues arising from the increase can be addressed fairly quickly. Clause 30 is similar to Clause 15 for prohibition of self-service in licensed premises in that it prohibits the supply of alcoholic drinks via any unsupervised means in a registered club, as was the case for Clause 15. Advice from the draft person of the Bill and the drafting of the Clause 30 could be improved to better ensure its enforceability, and I am therefore proposing amendment numbers 56 and 57. And staying with Register Club Schedule 113 to the club's order allows a non-member of a sporting club to pay a fee to use the club facilities for a day. The club's committee determines what facilities can be used, and there is no need to be signed in or be in the company of a member, which is normally the case. The Committee for Communities highlighted concerns raised by the PSNI during their evidence session over the use of one-day uh, club memberships. And it was reported that a number of sporting clubs were openly advertising for non-members to pay a small fee for the sole purpose of watching a televised sport or using the bar facilities, which is not the policy intent of this alliance. For this reason, I am proposing Amendment No. 62 to clarify the policy intent of the provision regarding one-day memberships. Um, these, Ken uh, Collier, are the amendments in Group 3. Thank you. Thank you. I call the Chair of the Communities Committee, Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. And can I apologise for my little uh, blip earlier of questioning you? Never mind questioning Claire McCallie uh, on what vote we're on. Um, so, can I just then uh, want to make a start on Group Three amendments? I'd like to start by taking this opportunity to reassure this House that the committee considered substantial evidence around the issues of alcohol-related harm and exposure of children and young people to alcohol. We took written and oral evidence and research findings from, among others, the Department of Health, the Public Health Agency, the Institute of Public Health Ireland, Stirling University, the British Medical Association, Assembly researchers, the Safeguarding Board and the Northern Ireland Drug and Alcohol Alliance. The committee also uh, remained mindful of the views it took during its Zoom informal stakeholders engagement event with young people on the 9th of March, who made many comments of rele relevance. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the young people who gave up their evening to take part, and also the Assembly's engagement team for facilitating the event. Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, on numerous occasions throughout its ev evidence, concerns were raised to the committee around the public health impacts of alcohol, the potential for increased availability of alcohol to increased overall alcohol-related harm in society, and the impact that can be made by controlling alcohol availability through licensing decisions. I would like to take the liberty of highlighting the recommendations that the committee made in its report in relation to public health. The committee recommends the public health messaging on the effects of alcohol misuse are communicated regularly as part of the liquor licensing system and as part of a communication strategy in connection with this new legislation. Also, consideration is given by licensing authorities to the creation of a meaningful role for local health bodies when licensing decisions are being made. And based on the feedback from our Young Persons event, that cross-departmental work is taken forward to devise an education programme to be delivered in schools, colleges 
and other youth settings on the potential harms of alcohol to health, family and other relationships in the manner of successful anti-smoking programmes have had. Amendments 35 to 38 cover amendments to Clause 11, Underage Functions. Based on the balance of evidence it received, the Committee broadly welcomed the provisions of Clause 11 around underage functions, which is a solution to allow those to go ahead in an alcohol-free, safe and controlled manner. For example, school formals in hotels that are that under current law must end at 9.30 p.m., which means that young people often go on to unsupervised venues and parties where alcohol may be available. However, members were concerned that the clause did not provide for under-18s on the premises, albeit in the process of leaving after 1 a.m. The Department thanked us for highlighting the need for a very necessary amendment, and the Minister has taken this forward as Amendment 37. The, the, minister, the Committee supports the Minister's Amendment 37 and also 35, 36 and 38, which are improvements to the drafting of the clause. The Committee also supports Amendment 51, which provides for the similar improvements to Clause 27, which applies to registered clubs. The Committee supports Amendment 39, which applies to Clause 12, which again was taken forward by the Minister at, at the community's request and allows for a child at a private function to be supervised by their own parent or a parent of another person under 18 and attending the function. In this regard, the Committee also supports Amendment 52, which provides for a similar improvement to Clause 28, which applies to registered clubs. The Committee has been concerned it was potentially too restrictive to require an under 18 to be attending the function in the company of a parent as defined by being someone with parental responsibility within the meaning of the Children's Northern Ireland Order 1995, and gave some examples of a child bringing a friend or a 16 or 17 year old care lever who had no parent. In connection with Clause 15, the Committee is pleased to support the Minister's technical and drafting improvements in Amendment 40 and 43 regarding the prohibition on self service and sales by vending machines and also supports Amendment 56 and 57, which amend Clause 30 in a similar way relating to registered clubs. The Committee had queried the use of honesty boxes to pay for alcohol, alcohol uh, in, for example, a guest house, and wanted to be sure that the prohibition would also cover this. The Department accepted that the clause needed further clarity, and Amendments 40 to 43 and 56 now cover this issue. Moving on to Amendment 44. I am pleased to support our committee amendment, which introduces new clause 17A, minimum unit pricing. As I have already stated, the committee considered the public health impact of the bill and to support a balanced package of measures to focus on alcohol consumption in controlled settings. However, we yes, certainly. I fully support the, the committee's view on this, but I am mindful of the comments made by the minister. It would appear that responsibility for minimum unit pricing rests entirely with the Department of Health. So, therefore, I am somewhat bemused as to, to the standing of, of the amendment that she is proposing, because it is clearly out with the bailiwick of the Minister for Communities to actually do anything about this. And therefore, what is the purpose of the amendment? Though it has considerable merit, what does she hope to achieve by having it in the bill? I thank the member for his intervention. This is the committee have put this amendment forward. Um, we understand from our departmental officials that this could be included in the bill, that we could compel the Minister for Health to bring forward minimum use unit pricing, so that is why um, we, have, we have included this in the bill. Um, we understand that there might have been issues for the minister to have it, to bring it forward herself, because that is one minister compelling another minister. But we felt, as an assembly, we would, should ask for this to be included in the bill. And I know from the health minister's perspective that he is also keen to see minimum unit, unit pricing put in place. Um, so I'll just continue, and I hope that explains it somewhat. Um, uh, continue here that the committee understands that the Minister for Health, Robin Swan, MLA, made a commitment in July 2020 
to undertake a consultation on the introduction of minimum unit pricing in Northern Ireland, and we felt at first that it was not within our remit. However, on taking advice from the Assembly Bill Office, it was determined that the issue was potentially within the scope of the Bill. And after considerable deliberation, the Committee asked the Assembly Bill Office to draft an amendment that would place a duty on the Minister for Health to introduce minimum unit pricing within three years of the Act coming into operation. The Committee has no desire to undermine or take away from the work of our Health Minister in this regard, but we felt we could not ignore the issue, and we sincerely hope that the Minister will support this amendment and that it will give leverage to the Health Minister as he takes forward work in this regard. With regard to Amendment 53 to 55, the Committee is pleased to support these amendments as they cover requests that the Committee made that the Minister take forward to Clause 29 relating to registered clubs, young people prohibited from bars. Based on consideration of its evidence from sporting clubs, the Northern Ireland Federation of Clubs and young people themselves uh, the committee requested that the minister extends this time period in 29-1 to cover the period from the 1st of May to the 30th December, to cover the time period that summer training and sports camps are running, and increase the number of award ceremonies in 29-3 to not more than three for those young people playing on more than one team. These changes are taken forward in Amendment 53 and 54. To allow for future changes, the committee requested that the minister take forward an amendment to allow for regulations to alter the time period and the number of awards cer ceremonies, if necessary. This is taken forward in Amendment 55. To complete this group of amendments, the committee is pleased to support the minister's Amendment 62, which deals with an issue that had come to the committee's attention during its evidence session regarding the inappropriate use of one-day club memberships. These memberships on occasions are being misused by simply allowing people to use the bar facilities and not to try out the sports and leisure facilities for which such one-day memberships were intended. The Minister supported this aim and Amendment 62 amends Schedule 1 to clarify the policy in respect of the registration of clubs Northern Ireland Order 1996 that allows a member of the public to pay a fee to use the facility, facilities of a sports club for a day to ensure that it is not used to allow someone to simply use the bar facilities. That concludes my comments on the Group 3 amendments. Just again, very, very briefly, I just want to reiterate my thanks to the young people um, and uh, the evidence session that they gave us. They very much, the, the information they gave us very much has shaped this part of the Bill. Um, without them, I don't think we might have come to some of the conclusions that we came to, and it just shows you the value again of, of having those people as part of, of our decision making here in the assembly. And again, very much great thanks to our um, education side here in the assembly for all of the work that they did in facilitating that. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I call Ms. Karen Mullen. As the Chair of the Committee and all our members have highlighted, the Committee undertook a wide range of evidence sessions from across interested parties – health, justice, tourism, hospitality and many more. During our deliberations, we heard the clear need to modernise our licensing laws, and I welcome that Minister Hargey has brought forward these amendments to the Licensing and Registration of Clubs Bill. This is an important piece of legislation that will have a positive impact on our hospitality, entertainment and tourism sectors. Group 3 amendments looks at minimising alcohol-related harm in society, and as the Chair outlined, the Committee heard a wide range of evidence from across health and others, including evidence from all our jurisdictions on how changes in their laws have either impacted or improved alcohol-related harm. Many of the amendments included in this section centred around under-18s and underage functions. Pre last can caller, I joined the committee in the middle of their deliberations, and I welcome that the committee had organised an informal stakeholder event with young people, which I attended. And like the chair, um, I want to thank and commend the young people because their contribution was invaluable. And I hope that that will be something that will continue on. I know there's all our legislation coming through the committee, and we had said that that night, particularly around the gambling laws and that, so it would be good to see that. 
and it was important that the young people were given the opportunity to take part and inform the amendments in this bill, as a lot has changed for many of us who are young, and I think we heard that that night. Um, but, uh, the committee also heard from the Safeguarding Board around the dangers of alcohol uh, misuse among children and their parents, but we also heard from them that young people are drinking less and there is less binge drinking behaviour, which shows some pro progress in relation to the health messages and this needs to be continued to be built upon. That being said, binge drinking and alcohol addiction continues to rise in our adult population. And as the Chair highlighted, the departments in this assembly should work closer and closely with young people to design and deliver education programmes around alcohol and continue to listen and learn from our young people. Amendments 35 to 38 cover underage func functions we will be supporting. If we take a look at Amendment 37, this clarifies the policy intent of the bill and fixes the problem or offence that would occur under the current draft format. Amendment 37 would allow a young person to remain on licensed premises while waiting to be collected. This is an important amendment and one that we will be supporting as it tightens the protection for young people, especially late at night. Amendment 39 allows an hour adult to fulfil the role of a parent guardian whilst, whilst a young person attends functions or events. Again, we will be supporting. We had lengthy discussions within the committee on, on the clauses to the underage functions and private functions. And as a parent of two young people, I share the same worry of many parents whose children are going to school formals and then have to leave to go to unsupervised parties. We want to see a safe and controlled environment for our young people to enjoy a night out with their friends. Clause 29 was discussed at length during our committee deliberations as it stands within the current drafting of the bill, under 18s could only attend one award ceremony in the bar area of, a, of sporting club premises per, per year between the months of June to the 31st of August. I feel that this was unfair to many young people, especially those who were playing for more teams within a certain club and that they would miss out on their award ceremony due to this clause. It's also restrictive when you take into account the various sporting, sports some young people are involved in and the different months of the year they operate. For example, I'm a secretary of the Waterside Boxing Club and our season usually finishes in May um, and returns in the middle of August. So Amendment 53 will, will allow uh, changing that so that under 18s can attend up to three award ceremonies per year between the 1st of May and the 3rd, 30th of September. And again, we will be supporting that. We also support the Minister's drafting uh, improvements to amendments 40 to 43 regarding not allowing alcohol sales by vending machines. We are supportive of the Committee's Amendment 44 that the Minister for Health bring forward legislation introducing minimum unit pricing. Um, we will also be supporting amendments 51 to 57 and amendment 62. And finally, Mr. Speaker, or Principal Deputy Speaker, I want to put on record our thanks to the Minister and the Department officials, in particular Liam and, Cl Liam and Carol and Claire from the Bowles Office for the work and support throughout the committee deliberations. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr. Mark Durkin. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Firstly, I'd like to echo the sentiments shared or expressed by others and recognise the importance of this section of the Bill in safeguarding children and young people from issues of alcohol-related harm. As much as the focus of this Bill is the relaxation of licensing laws, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that we are always trying to strike the right balance between a vibrant hospitality industry and responsible drinking. I want to reiterate assurances that a myriad of evidence and research was considered as part of this process. The public health impacts of alcohol are keenly felt, particularly in my own constituency of Foyle, and I am acutely aware of the scourge of addiction issues within our communities. Concerns have been raised from some quarters that alcohol-related harm could potentially increase given the availability or the increased availability of alcohol. This certainly did warrant careful consideration in conjunction 
with the fact that such issues have been further exacerbated over the period of lockdown. I would concur with the Chair's comments and, and those of uh, Ms Mullen on the value of our engagement with young people, and it is important that we continue to ask young people what they think should be in legislation rather than just dictate to them what, sh what, what, they, what they should think and do. Following engagement with those young people, the committee determined the best approach was a comprehensive education programme delivered in education settings, similar to other successful public health campaigns. And while a communication strategy must be embedded within the liquor licensing system, a cross-departmental approach will be key in addressing the potential for alcohol-related harm. I seem to have lost a page or two, or maybe someone took them <laughs> during the vote in there, just to speed things up a bit. But, but I'm supporting all the amendments anyway, so it's not that, that much uh, of an issue. M many of the amendments, of these amendments and those brought forward by the minister, are technical authorisations dealing with underage private functions and the requirement for under 18s to be accompanied by an individual with parental responsibility. In terms of these improvements, which we support, the focus here must be on the creation of a safe and controlled environment at underage functions and functions at which underage uh, people are present. Last time we debated the, the, the bill in the chamber here, I would raised concerns that the bill failed to, to touch on the minimum unit pricing issue, and I am pleased that this, is, this inclusion has now been afforded under Amendment 44, Clause 17a. In the interests of the public health impact of the bill, this inclusion was a necessity and is a necessity. I respect that last year uh, the Health Minister, Robin Swan, committed to consult on the implementation of minimum unit pricing here. However, this amendment requires the Health Minister to enact this provision within three years of this Act coming into play. It is better to ensure minimum unit pricing is accounted for within the confines of this legislation now, rather than putting this crucial element on or keeping it on the back burner where it has been for so long. To conclude, I support the amendments surrounding sports clubs and, in particular, Amendment 62, which deals, as others have said, with the misuse of one-day club memberships. This amends current policy to ensure that non-members can only avail of the club facilities if engaged in sporting activity, rather than the sole purpose of accessing the, the bar. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I just say at the start of this, I'm extremely tired at the moment, and to be honest, I hope that the rest of you in the room understand just how many hours that we have put in to this piece of legislation. So if you're tired along with me, uh, this is what it's been like for quite some time. Um, group 3, as has been stated, considers how we can minimise alcohol-related harm in society. And I would like to just take the opportunity to thank the Chair and to thank our clerks and all of the people who support us in committee for their efforts in ensuring the committee had access to a range of witnesses on the impact of alcohol has on health. Um, I could never have imagined the amount of witnesses that we would be speaking to and the range and the value that those witnesses gave us. But here we are. Um, the Minister will be pleased to hear that I'm not going to talk about 208 days or times or anything like that because I support all of the amendments that are coming forward in this Group 3. As the Chair stated, we had a very informative session with young people in March who brought us back to earth by confirming whatever rules we bring in, young people, if they're going to drink, they'll find a way. Um, and Minister, I have to say the fact that you have allowed school formals to continue on to one o'clock in the morning means that there will be, as Ms Mullen has said, a lot fewer young people disappearing off to those private house parties where they would be drinking. Um, and hopefully they'll get back to what it was like in the dark ages whenever I had a school formal. Um, the committee has recommended improvements to messaging and marketing of that message that needs to be brought forward. Misuse and abuse of alcohol is not just a health issue. We need to ensure through education we reach out to those young people and communicate in a way that suits their needs and in a way that young people will engage with. Never so clear has that been in the last year where, through COVID, we have had to adapt and adopt different methods of communication. 
I don't know how many times we've heard, I've used the word Zoom in the last year. Two years ago, you had never heard about that. Um, but we had the option through our Young People's event and many other events that our committee has had to engage with people in a way that actually gave them the opportunity to speak in a less formal way and a more communicative way. It, it has been very good, especially throughout this process. I have to reiterate what the Chair has said, that we have taken forward difficult programmes before. Um, the anti-smoking campaign was tough, but it worked. Wearing a seatbelt campaign was tough, but it worked, and I believe with appropriate cross-departmental commitment and investment, we can further address public health issues created through the abuse of alcohol. For instance, one of the things that the young people had brought up was the amount of adults or older young people um, who buy drink for them at off licences and carry it out to them. That's something that needs to stop and something that we need to consider how we can prevent that from happening. So we do need to engage, and that, that co-production, co-design um, does work. I'm delighted that the committee was um, permitted to bring forward a requirement in the bill for health to produce minimum pricing per unit within three years of this bill becoming an act. It is a matter for the Minister for Health, absolutely, but it is something that will help to reduce the abuse of alcohol. It has happened in other places, and it has been shown to work there. Um, while there is an ability for young people to attend functions later in the evening, they have to be accompanied by a responsible person acting as their parent. As I have said, school form must be allowed to continue until 1 am. And I am very grateful to the um, Minister for bringing forward Amendment 37. That is a reasonable allowance that will protect young people from hanging about outside hotels or that venue where they have had their event, where there could be adults who are leaving from a late licence in another venue. So I'm really grateful that, that that's actually a protection, a health protection that's there that's an unintended consequence of that amendment. I welcome the Minister and the Department's changes to allow sports clubs to permit young people to be allowed in premises over the summer season and for that extended time period from the 1st of May to the 30th of September. And that followed various dis discussions with various sports. And thanks to the Minister for allowing young people to access sports club functions up to three times per year during the rest of the year to attend, for example, an awards ceremony. And it was indeed through that youth engagement that we found out those different, as Ms Milne has mentioned, those different sports that don't always work over the summer. Cricket was one that surprised me the most um, when they said that they would have needed over the winter time to be able to access. The bill thankfully stops the use of self-service facilities such as vending machines and honesty boxes. A very welcome clarification and their removal will mean where alcohol is available, the venue has control over sales. Clarification on one day membership of clubs means people can no longer use club premises just to access the bar. They will need to be a member or have proof that they have paid a fee to use the facilities of that sporting club for a day. We talked about so many things when we were taking on um, the health considerations. We, we talked about limit on advertising, removal of alcohol from loyalty schemes. But one of the key things that shocked me the most was the evidence that we received from the University of Stirling, who really put it front and centre that we needed to consider the impacts um, to health in all of our considerations. And I know in Group 4 we will be talking about the surrender principle. Um, University of Stirling congratulated Northern Ireland on how we have limited the number of licences um, and the protections that that can have for the public, but we will talk about that later. It has been a very long time, but I do believe that in this bill we have not forgotten about health. We have not forgotten about the impact of addiction and the impact that alcohol can have on families and individuals. And I'd like to thank the Minister completely for all of her amendments. It just goes to show with how many amendments we have, how seriously this has been considered and how much thought, how much thought and consideration has gone into this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. I call Mr Jerry Carroll. Sorry, Mr Speaker. I expect others to be called before myself. Uh, yeah, only one amendment to address from this group, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, we'll be supporting all, uh, but trying to oppose, trying to vote against um, Amendment 44 around minimum unit pricing, and I'll outline my reasons why. Um, the reason being is that um, the demand for minimum unit pricing levels of alcohol, I think, in practice, um, will only prevent those uh, who cannot cannot afford it 
from buying uh, as much alcohol as they may decide or, or need to. Um, and to follow that logic, essentially, it says uh, only poor or working class uh, people will be priced out of alcohol. And I think in 2021, the assumption, um, either by, by the committee or by members, uh, that only working class people engage in binge drinking um, or to drink at unhealthy levels uh, will sound sort of terribly classist and, and offensive when it's spelt out. Um, and there's nothing to stop, uh, nothing to address rather, the underlying causes that drives people uh, to drink, uh, regardless of what price it is, whether it goes up, down, or stays the same. And not only does it make little sense to implement uh, a policy which will have little to no impact on those who earn enough or who are higher uh, earners, but it is also discriminatory to introduce a policy which would hit poor households um, the hardest, especially without uh, strong evidence to suggest, I um, certainly didn't hear it uh, this evening, to suggest poor households uh, engage in more hazardous drinking, uh, and particularly when the, the Assembly has just Pass another uh, budget, uh, an austerity budget, which is described as a standstill one. So, uh, so for those reasons, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, I would uh, uh, attempt to oppose and vote against Amendment 44. I appreciate it may be in a minority of one uh, again, uh, but I'll certainly uh, put on record my uh, opposition with it uh, for those reasons, because of who is targeted by it, and also because it doesn't do anything to deal with underlying causes to drive people to drink and to hazardous drinking. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Carroll. No other members indicated to me that they wish to speak on these group of amendments, and therefore I call the Minister to wind on the group. Minister. Yeah, and I'll just be very brief on this one. Again, just a thanks very much to the Chair, the Vice Chair, and the whole committee for the deliberations around this important part. And I think um, in working together to improve the Bill, um, we have offered greater protections as was listed, particularly around adult supervision, extending um, the date for events from May to September, uh, looking at the day memberships and honesty boxes, etc. The issue then around health and minimum unit pricing, so whilst I have stated it is not within my remit, um, I do support the call and also call on the Health Minister to bring that forward urgently. And indeed, the issues that was just raised last, I mean, those issues I am hopeful will be considered, um, will be debated, will be equality screened in terms of looking at the implication of any policy around minimum unit pricing uh, moving forward in the time ahead. And just lastly, quickly, in terms of the role of young people, I know a lot of members have uh, raised just how good it was um, to have young people involved, and I would agree. Um, and the importance of engaging young people in developing policy and how it affects them particularly and indeed just again the thanks to the Education Authority Youth Service Department who did facilitate engagements with young people as part of my department's 2019 consultation on the licensing laws. So thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Minister. Amendment, amendment number 35 uh, is amendment proposed to clause 11, page 16, line 12, insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 35 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 36 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to formally move Amendment 36. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 11, page 16, line 16, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 36 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 37 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 37. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 11, page 16, line 38. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 37 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 38 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargey, to formally move Amendment 38. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 11. 
page 17, line 12, the middle column, leave out and insert words as printed upon the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 38 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 11, as amended, stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 39 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargey, to formally move Amendment No. 39. Moved. Thank you. Amendment proposed to Clause 12, page 17, line 28, leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment No. 39 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. Aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 12, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 13 or 14. I propose, by leave of the Assembly, to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 13 and 14 stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 40 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargey, to move formally Amendment No. 40. Moved. Thank you. Amendment proposed as to Clause 15, page 19, line 8. Leave out and insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment No. 40 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment No. 41 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Ms. Deidre Hargy, to move formally Amendment No. 41. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 15, page 19, leave out and insert the words as printed upon the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 41 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 42 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to move formally Amendment No. 42. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 15, page 19, line 14. Insert the words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment No. 42 be made. As many as are of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment No. 43 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Ms Deidre Hargy, to move formally Amendment No. 43. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 15, page 19, line 26, middle column. Leave out and insert the words as printed upon the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment No. 43 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the clause 15, as amended, now stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 16 or 17. I therefore propose, by leave of the Assembly, to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 16 and 17 do now stand part of this bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 44 has already been debated, and I call the chairperson of the Committee for Communities, Ms Paula Bradley, to move formally the amendment number 44. Moved. Amendment proposed after clause 17, insert new clause, minimum unit pricing. 
question is that Amendment 44 be made and the new clause added to the Bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any, no. Aye. As there are, I think the ayes have it, but I am happy to state for the Hansard that Mr Carroll was opposed. No amendments have oh sorry, the eyes have it. The eyes have it. No amendments have been made to Clause eighteen. The question is the clause eighteen stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary if any no. I think the eyes have it. The eyes have it. We're now on to the fourth group of amendments. If members will take Point of order, Mr. Wells. Mr. Deputy Speaker, can I ask what on earth the Business Committee were thinking when they decided to put the Budget Bill and this particular piece of legislation on the agenda for, this, for, for the one sitting of this Assembly? It must have been very obvious to all concerned that we would not be starting this debate to very late. Now, according to my calculations, we have only 18 or 19 of the clauses dealt with already. We are now moving on to a very controversial issue that Mr O'Toole will be moving uh, on the sale of liquor licensing, license, licenses. And I think the fact that I can't even say it indicates how tired I am. Could, could I ask you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, to relay back to the Business Committee, of which I am not a member and on which I am not technically represented, that they must be more careful in the future because we are not doing our duty to scrutinise legislation at five to one in the morning simply because of bad time tabling? Insofar as that relates to the way in which the House and the business of this House is dealt with, that is a matter to be determined by the Business Committee um, rather than by the Speaker's office. However, I think you have put your point on the record, and I am sure the Business Committee, which is comprised by representatives of almost all of the parties who are represented in this chamber, will take note. If members could take their ease for a few moments for a change at the uh, top table, we uh, will then move on to the fourth uh, group of amendments. Thank you.
Uh, folks, you're, uh, you're, stuck, you're stuck with me for a while yet. Um, we now come to the fourth group of amendments for debate. With Amendment 45, it would be con convenient to debate Amendments 46 and 58 through to 60. I therefore call Mr Matthew Toole to move Amendment 45 and to address the other amendments in the group. Mr O'Toole. Thank you, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. And um, I'm tempted to say last orders at the bar, but that would be cringeworthy. Um, but there, I've said it. Um, uh, I will try and be brief. Uh, I, I, I certainly will um, be. Uh, I will address the critical issues in my amendments. I'll try to cover some of the other amendments in the group. Um, I, I'll try and reassure those, uh, Mr. Wells, who believe my. Uh, First Amendment is controversial. I don't think it is. Um, I think it's relatively routine, um, uh, but, but actually useful, and I'll explain why. Um, briefly, before I come on to um, my own amendments, number um, 45 and, and, and 46, I should uh, mention, given I'm uh, opening on, on, on the entire group, that um, uh, amendments 59, 58, 59, and, and 60 are. Uh, sensible from uh, the Minister, uh, Amendment 58 is a new clause on guidance that mandates the Department to issue and publish guidance about the effect this Bill has on the licensing order and the registrations of clubs order. Amendment 59 is a new clause on review. It requires the Department to rev uh, rep review and report on the functioning of particular parts of this Bill. The first review should be produced three years after commencement of the Bill, and thereafter a report should be produced every uh, five years. Uh, in a sense, that's what my First Amendment does, so I'm completely up for uh, review and report because that's uh, all that my uh, Amendment 45 does, and I think, it's, I think it's useful because I think part of what we've learned about the licensing system is that the more information we have, the more, uh, uh, the more there is review and, uh, and, and report, the more we understand it, then the more it can be, uh, we can assure for all stakeholders uh, it's working as well as it possibly could. Um, so, uh, and uh, I think Amendment 60 is relatively uh, technical uh, regarding um, uh, when restrictions come into uh, operation. So, to turn more specifically to the two amendments that are, that are uh, sitting in my name, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the first thing I, I want to say when talking about my two amendments, but particularly Amendment 45, uh, but actually both because they sit together and uh, attempt to do, broadly speaking, the same thing. Uh, is that uh, pubs mean a huge amount to me. Uh, they mean a lot to all of us. Uh, they mean much more than simply places to drink. In many ways, I grew up in the pub trade. There are publicans on both sides of my family. Uh, and from the age of 16, which is not uh, an appropriate age to be working in a pub, but I, I was working in a pub, I was working behind uh, a bar, uh, both locally and further afield. Uh, pubs, uh, for me, uh, like they are for many people, uh, are, uh, have been part of the fabric of my life. Um, and they are uh, for many people and for many communities. But all the available data shows that we face uh, a crisis in pubs in Northern Ireland. Uh, pubs have declined in numbers in all parts of these islands, um, but the decline has been sharper in Northern Ireland. Uh, all of the indicators are that pubs have declined more here. And specifically, we have a real challenge in terms of uh, replacing pubs that are lost because of the nature of our uh, licensing system. I'll come on uh, to that. Since 2001, uh, House of Commons library data, uh, which gathers its data from a range of sources, um, uh, indicates that the number of operational pubs in Northern Ireland fell by 36 per cent between 2001 and 2019. That is, by some margin, the fastest of all UK regions. Though the numbers uh, aren't directly collected for the same period, it's also sharper than the falls in the south of Ireland. Uh, I should acknowledge that I'm aware uh, that Hospitality Ulster um, uh, uh, pointed to alternative figures on, license, on licenses in operation, but they point to a broadly similar or a, a slightly smaller fall in the number of pubs, but no one disputes that there has been a very sharp fall in the number of pubs operating in Northern Ireland in the past couple of decades. And in the single year 2019 to 2020 alone, the number of uh, pubs fell by 3 per cent. It was the sharpest fall in uh, the UK. And critically to understanding uh, why uh, my review clause is important, other regions increased the number of operational pubs. Um, that, for reasons I will come on to uh, discuss, has been structurally very difficult to do uh, in Northern Ireland. Uh, the same data shows that since 2019, the number of staff working in pubs, the number of employees, has fallen by 22 um, per cent. 
we now have uh, the lowest number of pubs per head of population uh, in any region outside London. And of course, since London has such a high density of population, it is for that reason a bad comparator. Um, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, if pubs, or Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, I should say, you're, now that you've, you've uh, taken over the chair, if pubs were simply places to drink, then these trends would be less concerning. But pubs are much more than places to drink. They have real meaning to real people. Why was it that so many were genuinely affected by images of pubs reopening and people reconnecting with one another over the past fortnight? It wasn't simply about drinking. I will come back uh, to that point. As I said, it isn't simply about drinking because many of us have been doing lots of that at home anyway. Too many people have probably been doing too much of it at home. And uh, I will come back to that public health uh, aspect. Pubs are community hubs. They are meeting places, economic drivers, information exchanges, repositories of what might be otherwise lost local knowledge, incubators of creative talent, and so much else. When I think of my time working in pubs, I think of the richness of human contact I experienced and the people of different generations and backgrounds with whom I, might, uh, with whom I connected but might not otherwise have met. People like the late Joe Cassidy, who owned a shoe shop in Downpatrick. He drank bottles of stout off the shelf and by the brace, as he would say. The wise man seldom speaks, he counselled me once. Sadly for people in this chamber, I have never learned to heed that advice. Uh, Mr Speaker, I am tabling these amendments tonight because pubs mean a huge amount to people and we are losing them. The core of my Amendment 45 is simply about reviewing our licensing system because, as the figures I have already mentioned make clear, there is something that we need to address. But before we address it, we need to understand it. Uh, we need to have a proper evidence base. Uh, my amendment makes specific mention of the so-called surrender principle because it is impossible to properly review our system of liquor licensing without examining the core tenet of that, um, uh, of that system. Uh, I do not know if the surrender principle is the primary driver of closure, the closure of pubs in small rural towns uh, and indeed uh, pubs in, in larger towns too. In fact, we can be fairly certain that it is not. We know there will be a huge number of uh, reasons, factors that have created, that have contributed to this, but we need to understand what they are. We need to understand how the licensing system is playing into it. I do know that a very substantial number of licenses have moved from pubs to supermarkets and convenience stores with integrated off sales, uh, and those decisions uh, to sell those licenses were entirely reasonable. People are operating within the system of liquor licensing, which, which we have had in one form or another since 1902. It is worth bearing that in mind. Uh, this system has existed in one form or another since 1902. My amendment does not change it in any way. It does not alter it. It, doesn't, it does nothing to the licensing system. It simply says we should have a review of how the licensing system works. Indeed, um, the committee in its report said we should have a review of the licensing system, and they also specifically say we should have a review of the surrender principle. All my amendment does is put that on the face of the bill. Well, I will give way, yeah. Um, if only the member's amendment did only that. The reality is that there are many pubs in South Down and throughout Northern Ireland whose main asset is their licence, many who have borrowed money on the basis of that asset. And the grave danger of his proposed review is that banks will stop lending on the basis of that asset, given the uncertainty that his amendment will create. That will do nothing to protect small rural pubs in Northern Ireland. Nothing. Uh, I thank the member for his intervention, but let me make absolutely clear. Nothing in my amendment says anything about changing the surrender principle. It no, does not say anything about changing the licensing system. It calls for a review. And I would caution the member from putting out information that is inaccurate. To be absolutely clear, it does not. The committee report calls for a review of the surrender principle. There have been multiple reviews of the surrender principle. The licensing system is, by definition, under permanent review by the officials who oversee it. So putting out information that this is uh, somehow uh, about to change is, I'm afraid, wrong. Um, the, all my amendment does is, as I say, call for a review. It does set a time parameter and it does specify particular criteria. And if you look at the criteria that it specifies, it says explicitly that one of the things it has to take into account, along with public health, along with socio-economic conditions, along with uh, rural need and community need, is the interests of existing licensees. 
That hasn't been put anywhere in legislation before. There have been multiple reviews of licensing and the surrender principle. Nowhere before the, 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 right, the, the right honourable member, I should, I'm not sure he's the right honourable member, the, the honourable member uh, didn't note, never anywhere before in any of these reviews has anyone said that the enshrined and that should be the, 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 the uh, rights or the, the, the interests of existing licensees. I mention that, I make it absolutely clear, and it has to be uh, part of any review. But the thing is that our current system, uh, as I said, means that for all intents and purposes, once pubs uh, disappear, especially in smaller towns and rural areas, they are unlikely to ever reappear. And I would ask um, colleagues uh, in, uh, across the Assembly to consider that. Many of us will, uh, I, I don't represent a uh, rural constituency, but I'm from a rural area, uh, and there have been pubs that have closed in Belfast too. We know that pubs. I would give way to any member in this House who tells me that they haven't seen pubs close in their constituency. They're closing across Northern Ireland. If you look at the data, it's broken down by constituency by the House of Commons Library. East Belfast has lost 50% of its pubs in the last 20 years. Half of the pubs in East Belfast have shut. That's an astonishing number, and then I will give way. Away, and I, I, I'm glad he's, he's explaining his, his, um, his points here. But can I just add to that, and would he agree um, that part of the reason as to why we're seeing um, the decrease in our, our, our licensed premises in our pubs is that we need to do something more. They need to be something more, and the likes of the pub as the hub model would go some way also um, in retaining our, our, our pubs, especially in rural areas, to be more than just the pub. I, I thank the committee chair for intervention. I completely agree. And in fact, the pub is the hub model that Hospitality Ulster and others have been talking about is exactly the kind of thing that I want to see fed into this review. Uh, the review is not simply about the surrender principle. The review is about the licensing system. That's what it says. It says look at the surrender principle because that's fundamental to the licensing system. But it talks about the licensing system more broadly. It doesn't require change. It simply uh, requires a review uh, and information gathering and proposals. It doesn't oblige the Minister or the Department to do anything after that other than give the Assembly their response. It doesn't require action after that. It doesn't require, it doesn't require any legislative change to correct some of the, the, the misinformation uh, and to correct some misapprehensions. Uh, but yes, the pub, and the pub is the hub model is critical. And for existing licensees, I think it's really important that they understand uh, 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 and the sector understands that everything to do with the, the, the sector can be part of this review too, and it should be, it should be uh, questions of uh, uh, rates, questions of costs, all of those things can be part uh, of this review, and they should be. Um, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, to go back to, to my point about some of the issues we have, particularly with rural uh, and small town pubs, but not exclusively, uh, even uh, where there are large areas not served uh, by a pub, uh, where no one could credibly claim that they are already served by lots of licensed premises, it very, very rarely happens that people acquire licenses to reopen pubs once they've closed. And genuinely, I will give way to any member who is aware of a specific situation where, in a rural area, a pub has reopened. I'm, I, if it does happen, it happens very, very rarely. Um, uh, but this, as I said, is not just about uh, surrender and how licenses move around. Uh, my amendment provides, as I've just said, for a review of the licensing system. Uh, and draft recommendations. It is about looking, our, uh, looking at our licensing system in the round. It will also include a subsection two uh, of the amendment makes clear um, uh, social and economic factors. They will of course include uh, issues around how pubs can help deal with uh, loneliness and social isolation. And indeed, the committee chair just mentioned the pub as a hub model. Uh, and the pub as a hub model is completely about um, using pubs. Uh, particularly in rural areas, to establish themselves as community hubs of services, but also tackle uh, rural isolation and rural, um, a, 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 and rural access to services more broadly, whether it's postal services, uh, uh, other social activities. Um, and that goes back to the point I made earlier about pubs being about something much more than drinking. Uh, the review will also include, and it's explicitly mentioned in uh, Amendment 45, that review should also include questions of public health. Uh, and alcohol-related harm, because, as has rightly been said tonight, alcohol is rightly a controlled substance. It can and very often does create significant harm. But on that subject, it is uh, legitimate to ask and to gather evidence on whether a system which appears to incentivise 
uh, the movement of licenses from small pubs into off sales is the best way of encouraging moderate intake because as many people have discovered during our recent periods of lockdown there are no last orders in your own house no barman looking askance uh, as you have another drink no uh, bus or taxi to get home the point i'm making is that pubs do not equal alcohol harm and when set against people drinking at home they very often mean much less harm and set against that you have the broader range of social goods uh, that I have talked about earlier on. Given uh, we have lost so many pubs it is surely reasonable to simply gather evidence and examine whether the current system, uh, how, the, how the current system is working and that is what uh, Amendment 45 does. It does not, as I have said, change the licensing system. It does not create more uh, licenses. It does not uh, alter the licensing system in any way. It does not oblige the department to alter the licensing system in any way. It is simply a review. There has been widespread support uh, for my amendments from campaign groups, but as I said, um, uh, I want to address the concern uh, of a, any publican who thinks that my, a, a review of this will. I, I will give way to, to the member, but if he's going to stand up and rail and create more in, misinformation about what my amendment does, which I'm not sure he's actually read, then I won't give way. Okay. Would the member accept from me that Hospitality Ulster, which represents a large proportion of the small pubs in Northern Ireland, are totally opposed to his amendment and have lobbied many members in this chamber and asked us to vote against it? Now, how am I, as a teetotal non-drinker who doesn't go to pubs, meant to know better for, as far as the industry is concerned than their official body that, the official body that represents so many of their members well all i would say is read the amendment uh, the, uh, the member is in this place long enough to know that the best thing to do when you're debating legislation is to read what it actually does and to read uh, what the purpose of it is and it's fairly clear if you read my amendment as i have explained um, uh, in this House, and I have engaged with Hospitality Ulster on it, and I have had conversations with them. And I think, uh, th 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 they, though, as you said, they um, uh, weren't immediately keen on this idea. They have recognised that this is not simply about uh, this is about a broader review of the licensing system. And I have, in my speech today, endeavoured to explain that this is simply about a review of the licensing system. It is not about changing the surrender principle because this doesn't change the surrender principle. It simply um, uh, gathers. Evidence. I would also say, and this is really important, that the purpose of this review is to make, um, to allow us to understand how well our licensing system is working. That is a review that should and could work in the interests of existing licensees. I care deeply about their interests, and I want to see uh, this review work in their interests. Um, as I said, to be clear, Amendment 45. Uh, simply mandates a review of the system with draft recommendations and a departmental response to that uh, review to be given to the Assembly six months after the uh, initial independent reviewer uh, makes their um, report. Uh, and for the sake of those who did not read the committee report, let me remind everyone that the committee report, the committee report called for a balanced review of the surrender principle. All I am doing is putting that uh, on the face of the bill. As I have said, um, uh, I want to assure publicans that um, this is uh, simply a review of the system, and I would encourage them to participate in that review. Many of them uh, are keen, after what has been a very stressful year, to be assured that there is a bright future for this industry, and I do think uh, that this uh, amendment is uh, hopefully a critical part of uh, of ensuring that, of us planning for the future, and I want publicans to make their voice heard and influence it. I should say, um, uh, as I have said already, my amendment specifically uh, mandates the independent reviewer to consider the financial uh, interests of existing liquor licence holders uh, when examining uh, the system. Uh, now, that is something that has never, when the system has been reviewed before, ever been done, so far as I am aware. So, on the face of this bill, in legislation, are the interests of existing liquor licence holders. That is in the amendment, and if, it, uh, and if it passed, it would be uh, on the face of the bill. Let me also say um, uh, to colleagues who are 
um, uh, who are listening to what I say, um, that if my amendment passes, I would be happy to consider uh, amendments for, at further consideration stage, which um, either uh, offer more specificity to particular elements of the amendment, or indeed amend the timescale. I know some have questioned, some people who have been broadly supportive of the principle of reviewing how the licensing system works, have said that they think um, the timeline that I put in, which is basically to allow six months. Uh, allow the department six months to appoint an independent reviewer and then that independent reviewer take a year to gather evidence and report and then six months after that for the department to respond. If um, people were minded to support, I would be happy to consider uh, amendments at further consideration stage to um, prolong uh, that period and to look uh, at how long it lasts because to me um, uh, the whole point about this is uh, gathering information and reviewing it. It's not about getting any of this uh, done um, quickly, that's fine with me if it's on a slightly longer time scale because this is about long, ter uh, long term planning for how our licensing system works and if we do go for reform that will happen by definition years into the future after thorough information gathering. Uh, but I return to my core point. Our current system does not appear to be working and I would uh, encourage uh, members to pause and think about that uh, as they consider uh, Amendment 45. Northern Ireland has lost nearly 40% of its pubs over the last 20 years. We have basically, in effect, no way of replacing those pubs. Uh, we are making specific and welcome reforms tonight, um, when, if the bill passes its final stage, to how the licensing system works and the additional hours that have been created, the, the, the additionality around tap rooms I'm very much in favour of. But given the broad socio-economic context in which pubs operate and given the extraordinary community need, it is important that we look at what's not working uh, and examine it and gather information. And no one has anything to fear from that. Let me just be absolutely clear about that. So it's, I can't reiterate enough. All my amendment does is call for information gathering and review. And I think that is in everyone's interests. Amendment 46 is part of the same effort and simply requires the Department to regularise its publications on pub numbers via an annual report uh, on the number of 51A and 51B licences, basically the, the liquor licence, um, either in uh, pub or off-sale form, including their location by postcode. Time and again, I'm aware that the committee and others have found it frustrating to get information. What Amendment 46 does is regularise that by requiring the Department to publish the information on an annual basis. Uh, I don't see how anyone could object to that. I'm aware there are officials from the Department here today. That might involve creating more work for them. Uh, I'm I think very competent people. Um, but broadly, all that amendment does is regularise the publication of information uh, and make sure that it's online, people can access it, and NLAs and others can access it. Um, so I would ask people to support it on that basis. Um, um, I will give way briefly, yes. I'm a bit surprised by this particular amendment because my understanding is the Department of Communities already publishes a full list of licensed premises. So, so why, why the need uh, for further bureaucracy when that's done already? I'm not sure if you can find the list for me and tell me where, where it's published. Uh, that would be helpful. I will give way, yes. Um, perhaps I can help in this matter. Um, I had asked for a copy of that list and was told I could go to the courthouses and, and do that investigation myself. There is no list. We were provided very kindly with a map as part of our, our considerations, but the map was out of date. Um, there is no current list of all of our licences in Northern Ireland. I thank the member for that helpful uh, information and intervention. Uh, I, I, that's been my experience. I know that's been the, uh, the experience of others on the committee, that it is actually very difficult to get information about this. Um, our licensing system has been operating in its current form since 1902. Um, I don't know whether it should be reformed. I don't know um, uh, whether it should be changed. I don't think we should rush into anything. I simply think that we should gather information, gather evidence about how it's working, uh, and then uh, form a judgment in the years to come. So that is all my amendments 45 and 46 do. As I say, Mr. Speaker, I care deeply about uh, pubs, publicans, and the huge vital uh, contribution they make to our society. I haven't even talked about the contribution to tourism. Um, we know that, for example, um, uh, a critical part of our tourism offer 
uh, on this island as a whole, and, uh, and clearly uh, here is um, are our pubs. Uh, why shouldn't we, uh, given it's such a critical and structurally important part of our tourism offer and therefore our economy, uh, look to see if the licensing system is functioning as well as it could? So, in conclusion, uh, Mr. Speaker, I hope as many colleagues as possible can support uh, my amendments, which are grounded in a strong belief in the importance of the pub sector to our community, its vital role in protecting um, communities, in enhancing uh, mental health uh, for uh, people who use them, in tackling uh, isolation uh, and in binding communities together. Uh, so I'm very proud to uh, submit uh, amendments 45 and 46, uh, and as I said, I've covered the other amendments in that group. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I call Paula Bradley, Community Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm glad to be able to raise the issue of the surrender principle on behalf of the committee, as Amendment 45 gives me a reason to do so. Although not part of the bill, the surrender, princi the surrender principle for licences was highlighted to the committee in its written and oral evidence from both positive and negative perspectives. Alcohol licences can change hands for considerable sums of money and are often viewed as part of the assets of a licensed business. On a positive note, the surrender principle provides some control over expansion in the availability of licences and normalisation of alcohol consumption, which is not possible in any other part of the UK. On a negative note, it causes difficulties for smaller retail outlets in getting a licence and in rural, rural areas when a local pub sells its licence and it is snapped up by larger retail chains. The area may lose a vital community asset. The committee was certainly supportive of a review of the surrender, surrender principle taking place, and in its report the committee recommended that a balanced review of the surrender principle in terms of its impact on public health, the economy, and on rural and local community life takes place no later than as part of the first review of this legislation. The yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. The chair, forgive me. Can I just reiterate, because in case I wasn't specific enough in my previous remarks, the review in my amendment would not. Um, uh, it would it not would only would it not mandate any change. It would uh, not presuppose uh, any, cha any change to the surrender principle. It might state that the surrender principle is a good thing. It takes no positive or negative view on it, and the financial interests of existing licensees have to be at the core of any review. Thank you. I thank the member for clearing that up. Um, I just want to conclude on that part by saying whether Amendment 45 is the way forward in this regard is up to this House to decide. As with the previous amendment, Amendment 46 also gives me an opportunity to highlight several data-related issues that the Committee considered during its work in terms of data relating to alcohol and alcohol licences. The committee was concerned about the lack of a centralised liquor licence database, as members were concerned that there was no way to check for any imbalance in the range and spread of licences. The department agreed with the committee that there was work to be done in that regard to compile a full and accessible list of all licensed premises. The committee thanks the minister for engaging with the justice minister on taking this forward. Based on research it considered, the committee raised with the Department the issue of a lack of wider comprehens comprehensive database around alcohol issues, as members were concerned about a lack of available centralised data on many of the pertinent issues regarding alcohol sales, consumption and harms in Northern Ireland. The Department advised that it is working with its relevant officials in its professional services unit to develop an evaluation plan for the bill. The committee understood that available information will be used to determine a baseline and any relevant information identified which will be required to carry out an evaluation in the future. Based on all of the evidence it took in this regard in its report, the committee recommended that the Department of Finance leads an exercise to agree and take forward the, uh, with NISRA a cross-departmental database covering the range of societal issues that should be monitored, mainly alcohol licences, sales, 
consumption and harms in Northern Ireland. The committee also recommended that it, is, that it is provided with a draft of the Department of Communities Evaluation Plan at the earliest opportunity and sought assurance that the committee can feed into that plan on the issues that it would like to see included. Again, it is now up to members of this House to decide if Amendment 46 is, to, to, is the way forward on this aspect of data gathering in terms of annual publication of the number of operational liquor licences. Turning to Amendment 58, which provides for new clause 32A, this amendment was again one taken forward by the Minister at the Committee's request and so is supported by the Committee. The Committee heard evidence on the need for new legislation to be supported by strong and concise communications around the new licensing laws and any sub sub subsequently that time of the night, approved codes of practice so that individuals, organisations and businesses know exactly what is expected of them. The Committee agreed this amendment with the Minister to ensure that there is a duty to produce guidance on the new Act. In its report, the, report, the Committee also recommended that the Department for Communities issues best book and clear communications once royal assent is given to alert the various sectors impacted by the Act and direct them to the appropriate guidance materials. In relation to Amendment 59, which provides for new Clause 32b regarding review of the implementation of the Act, this amendment was kindly taken forward by the Minister, again at the Committee's request. Due to the potential breadth of impacts of this Bill on public health, emergency services, young people, the economy, tourism and the wider society, the Committee proposed that a new specific review clause be added to the Bill. After discussions between the officials and the Committee around the specifics and practicalities of the wording of the clause, the Minister accepted this request and I thank her for bringing forward this amendment, which the Committee is pleased to support. As reviews of the Act going forward is of a significant importance to the Committee, the Committee also recommended in its report particular areas that such reviews should include. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure all members have read the recommendations in the committee report, so I will not go into any more detail in what is a fairly lengthy list that, that of recommendations. Finally, on this group of amendments, the committee welcomes Amendment 60, which, amend, which amends Clause 36 to remove Paragraph A, that Clause Section 1 and 23, removal of additional restrictions at Easter, as the policy intent originally was to have these uh, provisions relating to Easter come into operation on the day after royal assent to allow for licensed premises to benefit from these positions in Easter 2021. The committee welcomes this am amendment. Mr. Speaker, I would just like to finish by just then again some comments as uh, a DUP member and a member of the committee. Um, on, firstly, on, on the uh, two amendments that have been brought forward by Matthew O'Toole. I um, can absolutely see merit in, and I know that it was in the committee report, that we do look at a review of the surrender principle. I think it's vitally important that we take that forward. Also on his amendment 45, I, I think again this is another uh, amendment that is of vital importance when it comes to data gathering. Data gathering which will be required when we come to the review, certainly in three years' time, uh, of how we compare. Uh, that data uh, now to uh, two, three years' time, so I would be in agreement of that. I just though, want to press upon uh, Mr. O'Toole as well, and I know I, I brought it up there during the discussions that, that you know that, that there are many reasons why our smaller pubs, uh, not just in rural but in our, our towns and cities, are, 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 are suffering and failing greatly. And I mean, there are many reasons whether that's the increase in people drinking at home whether that is the, 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 uh, the, 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 the lack of people using our pubs, and that's why I really do believe that the pub at the Sahab model could go some way um, to supporting that. Um, I just then want to um, just finish by just thanking um, everyone here this evening who's taken part in all aspects of this bill tonight. It's been a really long night. I also want to thank my committee colleagues 
who have done a wonderful job over recent weeks and months in just getting this to where we are today. And can I just then just say a special thank you to Janice, Sean, Antoinette and Oliver, our own committee team um, within our committee, who have supported us and guided us and shown great patience uh, in the last few months with all of our committee members. So a big thank you to them as well. And thank you, Mr Speaker. Thank you. I'm Paula Bradley, and I call Keeve Archibald. I'm um, Ken Coria, and, um, and I very much welcome the opportunity to contribute to this debate. And, and I want to commend the Minister for bringing forward this much awaited reform to licence and legislation. Um, it will be a hugely important and beneficial piece of legislation for the whole of the North. This bill has the potential to bring so much in terms of our tourism sector, our hospitality sector, and also in terms of jobs within different sectors. It's important that we get it through so we can begin to see the benefits of it as quickly as possible. And certainly from listening to the various different speakers so far, it reaffirms the importance of this bill to so many people and the enthusiasm that has been shown clearly by speakers this evening illustrates the significance of what it can actually deliver. Um, also, listening to the various different members who sit on the committees and, and having spoken to my own colleagues about it, I understand and I very much welcome the work that all members of the committee has put in to robustly scrutinising and deliberating on this bill. It's clear the interest that is there in terms of it with the number of written submissions that were made to the committee and the over 30 oral evidence sessions. Again, it highlights the, the need for the bill to be introduced as quickly as possible. Um, and as being highlighted by members throughout the course of the debate this evening, this year has been really, really tough on many in our communities. And obviously that's for those who've lost loved ones and those who've been ill most of all. But it's been hard on our businesses and on our workers. And of all the sectors, hospitality and tourism have been amongst those who are most impacted. Pub, club, hotel owners, bar, um, bar managers have all struggled with, despite the significant support that has been made available through the executive, bills continue even though premises are closed, and they've been closed for a hell of a lot longer than they've been open over the past 16 months. What this bill does, and while it won't be introduced for a few weeks, or within a few weeks, um, it will put licensed premises and local producers on a better footing to recover through extended opening hours, easing of restrictions around Easter time, and greater flexibilities. It's a chance to modernise our licence and laws and update them, um, and a chance, I suppose, to make our, um, our towns and cities more attractive to people who are coming here for long weekends away and all of those things. So, in terms of the amendments in this group, um, we are supporting 58, 59, and 60. However, we're not supporting amendments 45 and 46. Um, on the Amendment 45, tabled by Mr O'Toole around the review and surrender principle, Sinn Féin understands and appreciates that something could be looked at in respect of the licensing system, including the surrender principle. But in terms of this amendment, and I appreciate Mr O'Toole has, has uh, spoke to this, we feel the, um, the amendment is unrealistic, particularly in relation to the time frame. It's not, just not achievable in the context of that. Another aspect of it would be the financial cost to the department, um, which isn't really detailed in this. And I, I also um, have to say that I have heard from some pub owners and, um, who agree that there does need to be something looked at in relation to the licensing system and, in particular, the surrender principle support review, but believes there needs to be a carefully thought out and consideration given to that. And I think it is really important that we have a fair licensing system. I think there are issues there with the current system. And I very much agree with the points that have been made, both by, by Matthew O'Toole and by Paula and Bradley, in respect of the idea that hubs are, sorry, pubs are much more than just those things that sell drinks to people. They are about being hubs. They are about um, social support and social inclusion in, in our communities, and in particular in our rural communities. Yes, go ahead. I appreciate the member is giving way, in, and obviously I, I agree with much of what she's saying. Can I just say to her, in terms of um, timing, as I said in my previous remarks, I'm happy to, if this passes tonight, I'd be happy to look at the timing. I'd be happy to extend the period. I'm in, in no way precious about that. Uh, and secondly, I suppose the other point I would make is there's just a question about, in terms of reviewing this, 
I have no fixed outcome. There is no fixed outcome in this amendment. But the key thing is, I suppose if we don't do it now, when will we do it? We know that this uh, uh, licensing bill fell before the institutions fell in 2016. And we don't tend to do these things very quickly, and we won't do anything on this very quickly. That's why I suppose my point is, why not start now? It might be a decade before we do anything, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> No, and, and I thank the, the member for his um, intervention, and um, I, I appreciate the comments that he's made, and, and I know the minister will address them in, in her response as well. Um, and I also think that, and I, I, this has been remarked upon by members over the course of the debate this evening as well, um, some of the trends that we have seen over the past year of people drinking in their own homes and, and the, the increased consumption in that respect it is quite worrying, and I think it is much better that we have regulated settings and measures in, in that respect and, and so having a licensing system that is fit for purpose is really important in that respect. However, at this time when our hospitality and tourism sectors are only just getting to, to reopen, um, not even close to being back on their feet, I think a, a rushed review could cause uncertainty within the sector and that may have unintended consequences and therefore while sympathetic to the intent, we won't be supporting this amendment. Um, just in respect of the Minister in Amendments 58 and 59 has outlined the provision of guidance and review um, of such including reporting which gives a good opportunity to keep the implementation of this legislation under review. Um, so in terms of Amendment 46 around publication, given the Minister has already agreed to review and reporting um, in more in-depth and over a longer period, we feel this amendment is um, unnecessary at this point. And I also uh, reflect on some of the comments that have been made about the, um, the information that is actually held by DFC in respect of that. So just in summation, I, I once again want to note the importance of the legislation and the reform of licensing. I think this is a positive day and believe that the reform outlined in this bill will reinvigorate our hospitality and tourism economy, take us out of the dark ages in some respects. Um, I'd like to put on record um, my thanks to the committee for its work and also to commend it on its consideration of all the issues, complex as they are, in particular in striking that balance um, in terms of necessary reform, but also in protecting health. And of course, I think we, we all recognise that alcohol does cause harm, and there is work beyond the scope of this bill in terms of education around those issues. But I'm very much of the view that regulation is the, the way to go in terms of um, harm reduction. So again, I just want to thank the Minister and the Committee, and I look forward to this bill completing its passage and being implemented. Thank you, and I call Kelly Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're nearly up to two o'clock, so we're nearly at our late licence, um, but the end of our late licence. But I just want to take the opportunity to say I agree with Mr. O'Toole. Pubs are a key part of many people's lives. We just have to look at how much we've missed our pubs and hotels throughout the pandemic. And I think I would just like to make the point now, as, as Ms. Archibald has just said, this is a good day. This is legislation that has been a long time coming. And while there have been lots of votes tonight and there have been lots of things that have gone through, this is modernising our liquor licensing and our, li our registration of clubs. And I think that is something we should be celebrating. I know that um, as a member of the committee, I've been in awe of the amount of work that our committee clerks, fellow committee members, um, so many members of the department, the bills office have helped us. Um, but on behalf of Alliance, I want to say we will be supporting Mr O'Toole's amendment calling for an independent person to undertake a review of the licensing system, including the operation of the surrender principle. And why do we support that review? Because as it states in the committee report, people gave us both positive and negative experiences of that surrender principle. As University of Stirling, um, who were witnesses at, in the committee, confirmed our surrender principle controls the number of places that sell alcohol, and that's a good thing. They pointed out that that was very welcome when it came to health. However, we also heard that when a license holder sells their license, as they have the right to do so, of course, that license is often sold to the highest bidder, and in many cases, this is to a supermarket. This means that the pub, the one that sold its license, is no longer in the area, and the loss of that license doesn't help the pub and the pub is the hub model promoted by Hospitality Ulster. And I really like that model, and I actually thank Hospitality Ulster for introducing us to that. It's something that we should be aspiring to. As the committee recommended, 
that a balanced view, a re balanced review sorry, of the surrender principle in terms of its impact on public health, the economy and on rural community life should be done. Mr O'Toole's Amendment 45 provides that new clause 18A that enables the opportunity to review the licensing system, including that balanced review the committee has proposed. As others have said, the review does not mean that change will happen or that bad change will happen. Licence holders absolutely should and will have input to this review. The independent reviewer could even turn around and say that the licence system and the current surrender principle is fine. We need to trust that independent report. I also support Amendment 46. I believe that it is appropriate that an annual publication of the number of operational liquor licences is produced. This list will help us to see where the licences are located, where there is a concentration of licences or where there is a gap in provision. It will help planners, it will help councils, it will help the police, it will help the health service. There is always merit in having access to data. I absolutely support the Minister's um, Amendment 58 and 59. I think that it's absolutely right and proper that guidance should be produced. We don't want people to guess how this licence, how this act is going to work. And it's right and proper that professionals that work with the Minister are involved with producing that guidance. Absolutely, we should have a review, as it says in an Amendment 58, at three and then five years. And it does give the opportunity then for the Department to end the reports if they so choose to do so after 10 years. Support um, Amendment 60, that technical amendment. But before, just as I, I close, um, Mr Speaker, this is a good day. And while not all my amendments were accepted by everyone, I think that people I don't think anybody's listening in to us at this stage, but there might be some. Um, we'll say that we have worked really hard as an assembly to try to get a balanced way forward for the people who currently hold licenses, for the tap room, the local producers, and for everyone. But most importantly, we have a hospitality sector that is trying its best to get back after COVID. I want to help them. I think we all want to help them, and I think that we've gone a huge way forward tonight in bringing that forward for them. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Rachel Woods. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I am not going to go into detail about all the clauses in the group, um, as others have already done it. But at the outset in particular, I will be supporting all the amendments in the group and wish to highlight I suppose, a few matters in relation to 45 and 46 in Mr O'Toole's name and 59 in the name of the Minister um, to have an independent review of the licensing system. And I suppose in the face of it, you know, the reason for the support is a simple one. Why not review? Why would we not have an independent review of a system to know where we stand? And from previous pieces of legislation I've worked on in this assembly, specifically in the Justice Committee, in my short time here, having a review system and a review mechanism to show effectiveness, say, of the creation of a new offence is something we've pushed for, and I'll continue to do so. So I see no reason why this can't be a standing a part of this bill when it comes to our licensing system, which is understandably, and we've seen tonight from the debate, incredibly complicated. And there's nothing to be feared from a review. It's good to take stock and see how things are progressing, how they're working, who they're working for, or who they are not. Um, and turning to 45, and whilst I, ex I understand completely that there would be issues in over overhauling the entire surrender principle now, and the consequences for so many publicans if that's happened, but that's not what 45 is doing. And I note that Mr O'Toole has already mentioned compensation and that his amendment also mandates that the interests of existing licensees, including the option of compensation, must be examined by an independent expert. And I see nothing in these amendments anywhere that would suggest that there would be a free-for-all, nor anything to do with cheaper alcohol. And I would welcome an intervention from anybody that can see that. This may, of course, have repercussions on loans, banking, finance, affordability and impacts elsewhere not covered here, but that's what a review does. It shows what impacts could potentially happen. And, and to look at the current system, the distributions of licences, the functioning of a system and where appropriate it drafts option to compensate. Basically, it gives us information. But all of this is bedded in a report of recommendations which must be laid before this assembly and it, for its arrangement to be published. Nothing happens without the support of this assembly. 
So I do welcome um, Mr O'Toole's intention to look at the timing contained within his, uh, within his amendments at further consideration stage, because I would have concerns just about the, uh, within the year or six months after, just with the business that this assembly has to, to deal with and with the department as well. Um, so I, I look forward to discussing that at a later time. And Amendment 46 arranges for data to be collected um, on a number of operational licences and it for it to be published annually. Again, there's nothing to be fearful of data collection. It's key for so much in our society, and I see no reason for data not to be collected on the number of licences in operation and the number of operational public houses by location. And again, there's been much said on potential impact and unintended consequences of these amendments, especially in terms of rural pubs. So I think we need to support our rural pubs. I don't see anybody saying um, anything against that. And especially through the pub is the hub campaign that others have mentioned. And there is much merit in helping pubs through regulations that would allow them to enhance community services like post office, farm shops and also facilitate community meetings, events, internet access points, as well as initiatives to tackle loneliness and social isolation. And we know from recent reports about the social value that pubs and publicans create by providing local services, especially during the uh, first COVID-19 lockdown. A new report from Pub is the Hub measured the social value impact of services and found that for every pound spent on a project through the Pub is the Hub Community Services Fund in the first lockdown, between £8.98 and £9.24 of social value was created. And I know it's usually Mr Catney who likes to go into stories about his previous public and life or his experiences within this, but this recent exchange and this, uh, what we're talking about today uh, came to mind um, for me a, in relation to Mr O'Toole's amendments and the lobby around rural pubs in a recent conversation that I had with my grandmother and she's 92 years old and was brought up in rural Galway in the 1930s and she'd mentioned that back in the day um, you had to go to your local pub to get fresh yeast for baking. You couldn't get it anywhere else because there was no groceries or stores around her. She had to get a form from the police to say she wasn't illegally brewing her own alcohol, but that is another matter, um, and you couldn't get anything else there. All the other local services and access to groceries, I say, were miles away, uh, by walk or bicycle, not by car, um, in the rain, hail and snow, and you couldn't go and get your big shop, let alone your small shop. And it would seem to her, um, as I explained what I was doing today in the chamber and what I was working on, she said, much is still the same today for our rural pubs. So we haven't changed. It's from the 1930s Galway, 1940s Galway. We're still having people to travel to get local services, access to groceries. Why are we not supporting Pub is the Hub campaign? So the point is that the community pub is the hub. It has been for years, and especially in rural areas where other local service provisions do not exist or have ceased to exist for any number of reasons. So what are the regulations that need to be amended to facilitate licensees to widen community rule uh, based on the pub as a hub model? Perhaps the minister can detail if this is required through primary legislation, if it's secondary, or if it's something that can be done by way of regulation after this bill is passed. Turning to Amendment 59, which is a new clause from the Minister, and I welcome this one to ensure that there would be a review and a report on the implementation of provisions in Part 1 and 2, and I would urge the Department in reviewing the provisions to properly consider impacts from the point of view of staff and those who work in the industry, the frontline workers, the KPs, the chefs, the bar staff, the cleaners and the suppliers, not just the traditional stakeholders and also cover the, some of the additional issues that have been considered by the committee and others connected to health, socio-economic impacts and that which falls directly outside the scope of the bill. We are aware of a number of issues that staff have had to face. Uh, it was raised at second stage, committee stage and also tonight too, that of staff safety about sexual harassment about the responsibility of business holders in getting staff home at night time, uh, kicking out time and the impact of the one hour versus 30 minutes drinking up time and the lack of staggering of closing hours in this bill and the impact um, of them on their legal entitlement to breaks, for example. 
and if there is any issues in um, ensuring that they are um, getting rest periods and getting adequate periods of time between shifts. So whilst I appreciate having specific social clauses maybe outside the scope of the bill at this stage, I think this is something that should be a part of review and then a joint approach taken by the executive to ensure that all of this can be legislated for and that staff on fair work principles and that any exploited practices can be tackled can be done through legislation. This is a huge body of work. I, I, do, I do take that. And I would welcome a specific work stream to be undertaken by executive ministers on these issues, because this is across, across the departments, and how we can support the hospitality and tourism industry as a whole with working conditions and workers' voices heard too. Finally, as part of any review, a matter I mentioned at length in Group 1 is the impact of the coupling of the entertainment licence with the liquor licence. Again, I note the majority of respondents to the consultation favoured the continuation of the status quo as we've had since 2016, which is not what we have now standing in Clause 3. And additionally, in the consultation report, there was a common theme for justifying an extension of permitted hours with staggering closing times. Again, something I would hope that would be considered as part of any departmental review, both in terms of reducing antisocial behaviour and fights, perhaps after being um, in, in a licensed premises, a number of issues were brought up by Mr. Wells and Mr. Allister, and also reducing pressures on both police and emergency services. Um, we've had a number of other uh, issues brought up. Again, um, the chair has said that she wasn't going to go into all of them, but that is, uh, the, the recommendations are there in the report for anybody who has read them, and I have. Um, so I think this is a key area uh, in terms of review that the department should work on um, and the consequences of this bill as a whole. And if we're legislating to extend drinking up times, later licenses to try and also assist with ending a bottleneck of people leaving bars and clubs at the same time, amongst other things, of course, then this does, uh, does this actually do what it says on the tin? So I hope all those points could be taken into consideration and we will be supporting all the amendments in this group. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. And I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy. Yeah, thanks very much, and again, thanks everybody for the contributions um, that were made. I'm just going to start then in terms of Amendment 45, just tabled by Matthew O'Toole, um, and that would require the Department for Communities to appoint an independent person no later than six months after the date of royal assent to carry out a review of the licensing system, including the operation of the surrender principle in respect of licenses. I do have a number of concerns about the feasibility of this um, amendment, and I know Matthew has spoke to uh, the officials as well. Um, and I have asked my officials to take advice on whether um, of what's being asked within the department is actually achievable within the time scale set out. And while I agree um, with the importance of pubs in communities that Matthew has raised, um, I do struggle to support the amendment um, as it can't be delivered within the time frame um, that would be required and that would be set out. That said, if it was voted down or not moved, I would be willing to give a clear commitment to engage to see if it can be included at a further consideration stage if that was to be allowed by the Speaker and then for a better timeline. Um, to be looked at um, in line with what we would see deliverable within the department. Although my department is responsible for the policy and legislation in relation to the retail uh, sale of alcoholic drinks, the courts are responsible for issuing these licences. Um, and obviously, the records of these are held by the courts, and therefore, it would be for the DOJ minister to publish. Um, and as was noted, I have written to the minister in terms of following up this work as well. And I know that some um, had mentioned uh, that the courts do provide the department with figures every year, albeit that's caveated that they are taken at a point in time. Uh, they are issued to stakeholders who request them, and again, that that's caveated in being issued to them that it is subject to variation over the years as well. So there's no doubt there is work and improvements to be done um, around these parts of the system. There are 38 articles alone in the licensing order that relate um, to who and what type of premises a court can grant a license to, the court process of applying for a license, including the grant renewal duration of the licenses and the type of information to be held by the courts, 
There are 38 articles in the general licensing system as part of the order, and indeed the order also contains another eight articles on permitted hours, a further 27 articles on conduct off licensed premises, and 20 on the enforcement and more on miscellaneous provision. There are 13 schedules to the order. Altogether, these articles, which form the licensing order, provide for the licensing system here. The Member's Amendment specifically states that the review includes the operation of the surrender principle. And the surrender principle, in a nutshell, means that anyone who wants to apply for a pub or off-sales licence is required to hand over a current licence for either a pub or off-sales. The principle dates back, as was said, to, to the early 1920s and had the intended effect of placing a cap on the number of pubs and off-sales here. It is an attempt to influence the health and social behaviours of consumers. Over the years, the cap on the number of pubs and off-sales have created a lucrative trade in licensing within the private sector. And there has always therefore been an argument that removing the principle um, in itself will devalue uh, those businesses who have already invested in their licences. Um, which are far too often recorded as an asset in financial records. Previous ministers considered removing the surrender principle, and indeed an independent impact assessment was carried out a number of years ago by the then Minister Margaret Ritchie, who was responsible for the department then that was DSD at the time. The report on the assessment showed that there was insufficient evidence supporting the need for removal, and with the potential damage to existing businesses, a decision was taken um, not to take any action. This independent impact assessment relates to only one of the components detailed in the Member's Amendment. It took the region of 11 months to complete, and it cost in the region of £21,000. I have been advised by officials in procurement and consultancy that given the complexity of such a review, the sheer size, scale and number of variables, pre-market engagement would be required. This would take somewhere between four and six months and would assist in the development of the terms of reference before going out to tender. I have also been advised that for the project um, such as this, a multidisciplinary project team would be required that would include economists, experts in health and social harms, competition law and licensing. It would be likely that one consultancy firm would not be equipped to carry out this entire project. The advice I have received suggests that a scoping exercise uh, would need to be carried out to be able to put a time scale and a cost for such a review in place. And it has, however, been estimated that a review um, of this magnitude would be expected to take longer to complete and costs would need to be worked out. For these reasons, I have explained um, that I could not support the amendment as it is at the moment because it would not be practical to take it forward in the timescales. It would also enshrine timescales and scope of the review in law, and given the timescale set out in the amendment can only result in the production of an extremely poor report. I know that Matthew has also tabled Amendment 46, which introduces a new Clause 18b to the Bill. This amendment will require the Department to produce an annual report on the operation of liquor licensing system here and the number of pubs and off licences in operation um, and a 10-year rolling forecast of these premises. An annual report on the liquor licensing system would place a significant burden on the Department's time and resources, and that would obviously need to be looked at. In terms of some of the components um, of that report must include, I do not believe is, um, it to be the appropriate uh, way to require my Department to publish figures that would need to be provided by another Department. And as I said, the Department of Justice is responsible for the courts um, who actually do the licences. The figures for the licences in force are also subject to change as they are provided, as I said, at a point in time, and licence holders um, have up to a year to renew their licences after the end of the licensing period. Some licences are granted for lesser than the licensing period. There is also no way of predicting how many there will be in the future, and for these reasons I do not support this amendment. Moving on uh, some of my own amendments, the Committee and Communities uh, for communities considered a number of places in the bill where it requested clarification, and I've linked this um, and have linked this to the complexity of the bill. 
The committee and I agreed amendment number 58, which introduces a new clause 32A to the bill, placing a duty on the department to produce and publish guidance and provisions of the final act. I am also proposing amendment number 59 at the request of the Committee for Communities to require the Department to carry out a review of the implementation of the final act. The first review is to be carried out as soon as practicable, as practicable um, after three years following the commencement of these provisions. Subsequent reviews will take place no later than five years after the last report, with the inclusion of a regulatory power that will allow the Department to cease these reviews. This power cannot be used uh, before the end of the period of 10 years, beginning with the date of royal assent, and regulations cannot be made unless approved by a resolution of the Assembly. Finally, I want to propose Amendment 60 to remove the requirement of Clause 36 to bring a removal of the additional restrictions at Easter in the operation on the day after the Bill receives royal assent. This will include in the bill um, when there was a possibility of having those provisions in place before Easter of this year and is no longer necessary because we've passed that date. And really, just to conclude, I want to extend my sincere thanks to everybody that's participated in this debate. I am glad that we have this bill at this stage and that it's going to progress. Again, I want to thank the Chair, the Deputy Chair and all of the Committee for the engagement. And I do think the work that we have been able to uh, do together in making amendments has made for a better and more balanced bill. So I want to thank you. And again, just to thank um, the staff and officials within my department. Carl, who has actually worked on this bill from 2006, so she probably thought it was never going to reach this stage, and, and thankfully it has. Liam, who's worked on it from around 2014, and indeed Suzanne as well. And again, we want to thank those within the Bills Office and within the committee uh, support as well, and indeed those within the Assembly tonight. So thanks very much. And I call Matthew O'Toole to wind. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I will try and uh, keep it brief. Um, uh, I, I, I welcome the debate. It's been, um, uh, it's been very productive. I echo what everyone has said about the importance of this legislation and the importance of, um, of debating it. And, and, and whatever happens uh, with the, uh, whatever happens with it, it's, it's good that we're debating it. And it's good that we're making reforms. Um, just to go through uh, a few of the comments, um, I think the committee chair, uh, the committee chair, talked about the fact that the report wanted a balanced uh, review of the. Of, of the surrender principle. I, I couldn't agree more, and of, and of course, just to reiterate my point, it's not about simply a review of the surrender principle. Uh, this amendment is about a review of the licensing system. I'll come on to what the Minister uh, discussed about it later. It, it is critically about getting uh, data gathering and more info. I couldn't be more, um, uh, I couldn't be more in agreement, as it were, on the, um, uh, on the, on the importance of the pub is a hub model. It is also true uh, that, um, uh, that um, the, the review, in terms of the, the other um, amendments making, uh, uh, clarifying and introducing review mechanisms for the bill, that there are, um, the precedent has been set, if you like, for review mechanisms. Uh, in a sense, what my Amendment 45 does is simply to extend that into a, 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 a broader review of, of, uh, of, of, of the licensing. Um, system. Uh, I, I recognise that people uh, want to understand that this is going to be a uh, carefully thought through uh, and holistic review of the licensing system, and that is why I have drafted uh, Amendment 45 um, the way I have. Uh, Kiva Archibald, um, I, I agree with much of what she said. Obviously, I, I um, uh, do not agree with uh, her view of the, the, the amendment, but I agree with nearly everything else she said about the system, how it is uh, regulated. Um, uh, in terms of timing, as I have said, um, and I will come on to more of this when I talk about what the Minister said, um, if, my, if my amendment passes tonight, I would certainly be amenable. In fact, I will be looking to clarify the timeline. It is clear that people, um, that this is uh, something people have raised. Um, the, I have, I'm not going to, as it were, die in a ditch over the timeline of this. I uh, think it's m much more important that it is got right 
um, uh, and done uh, and done properly. So uh, I, I'm not wedded to to the timeline. And, and if my amendment did pass tonight, and that is for the assembly to decide, um, then I would certainly uh, be uh, working with others to bring forward a uh, an amendment at um, uh, further consideration stage, which clarified. And I, and I would hope the speaker would take that because it would be a uh, I hope a relatively straightforward uh, amendment to uh, the amendment that I'm putting down tonight. Um, uh, Kelly Armstrong, um, uh, it was uh, clear, as I was clear, that nothing in my amendment changes the surrender principle. I, I think perhaps because I specifically mentioned the surrender principle in the title of my amendment, um, people uh, have perhaps seen that as the, the monomaniacal focus of the amendment. It isn't. Um, it simply mentions it because I think it's important that we uh, understand and acknowledge that this is a critical part of how our licensing system works. It wasn't really, in a sense, in the, sort of in the scope of the original bill when this was first presented. Uh, the bill that we're debating now to the Assembly back in 2016. Obviously, the officials will, will have been living with this and uh, enduring this for a number of years. So, the purpose of putting it, the free is, and the reference to it in, in the amendment is that it is part of the review, not because it's the sole focus of the proposed review, but simply because it's critical to understanding how our system works. And as I said, and as Kelly Armstrong said, um, uh, it doesn't presuppose change. It doesn't uh, say there would be good, bad reform of the surrender principle or indeed any other aspect of the licensing system. It's simply about understanding it uh, and having a, a, a fulsome look. I, 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 so I, I don't understand or see how it could, um, uh, you know, in a sense, have any kind of uh, prejudicial financial consequences um, when it is simply, uh, in a sense, a, um, a statutory uh, version of what is already being called for in the committee report, and in a sense, the, the department is already pledging to do in other parts of the in other parts of the bill in terms of reviewing. Um, Rachel Woods mentioned. Um, well, first of all, it sounds like Rachel Woods. I think we'd all quite like to go to Rachel Woods' granny's um, uh, tap room in Galway, which sounds like great crack. Unfortunately, I'm sure it's closed now. And it's a long drive to Galway. Um, uh, data is critical. Uh, uh, Rachel mentioned the uh, importance of of getting data right. She also pointed out, which is true, that nothing in either, uh, certainly not in Amendment 45, has anything to do with uh, cheap drink. Sometimes people rushed. Well, first of all, nothing in my amendment creates any reform or, pre or presupposes any reform. Secondly, even if there was reform at some date in the future, which would have to be debated, decided, and discussed by this assembly. Um, uh, in, in years, literally in years to come, um, uh, no, no kind of reform would need to necessarily be like it's done in England. It doesn't necessarily mean licensing liberalisation. It could mean any number of things. It wouldn't necessarily even remove uh, the uh, surrender principle. As I say, this review would simply examine how it and the rest of the licensing system um, is working. Uh, Rachel, too, I, I think talked about the importance of the pub as a hub model. And, and, and why that's so important is that, uh, to me is that I think my amendments are, are really uh, endeavouring to, um, to, to, to create a review structure that uh, sees how we can best make that a reality. I think we all want to see it become a reality. Rachel also mentioned the importance issues around staff safety. Um, and we are, when we're extending uh, licensing, as we are doing in other parts of this bill, it's really important that we uh, recognise that we are creating additional um, burdens and occasionally at times stresses and risks for staff. She also mentioned, I just want to touch on this, I will be as brief as I can, Mr Speaker, she also mentioned the question of staggered closing times. Um, uh, people have been in touch with me about this. There is actually a strong argument for that. That's something I think to be considered in the future. There's a strong argument in that in terms of um, staggering to you know, make closing times as secure as possible, but also uh, build the nighttime economy um, uh, in, in terms of entertainment venues and, and performers. Um, uh, so I just finally then come on to um, the minister's uh, uh, remarks. I welcome the fact I've dealt with a lot of it. I welcome uh, the fact that the minister um, acknowledges that there are uh, that there is something to be reviewed here and that there is something to uh, engage. I, I recognise that she's given a clear uh, commitment to engage. I um, uh, w will say that if my amendment falls tonight, um, I will be certainly taking her up on that offer in a constructive way. If it passes tonight, I will be uh, coming forward with a clause at further with a, an amendment at further consideration stage, which I hope is taken, which would um, address the issue of timeline and any other technical issues that 
either uh, the department or uh, even, even others in the sector felt uh, could be usefully clarified, because uh, the purpose of this is not to rush headlong into something, nor is it to um, presuppose an outcome. It's simply to design a system and to guarantee that we have a, uh, a, a review. Um, uh, so, um, so, so that's uh, the purpose. I, I, I appreciate the detail that the Minister gave. That was uh, useful for me in terms of understanding the logistics of what it would be uh, required. Um, uh, uh, and I, um, uh, uh, and I uh, respect that. As I say, if my amendment passes tonight, uh, I don't see that as the end of this. I would be happy to look at further uh, amendments to uh, give comfort to the department that they will have the space and what they need to make it work. Um, uh, if it doesn't pass, uh, I will also be uh, engaging and lobbying with the department to ensure that uh, as the minister said, that this is not this doesn't fall by the wayside, and that we have other means of doing it. Um, I, I, I do think I, I mean I don't agree with the minister on, on uh, in relation to point 46. I mean that she did acknowledge that there are um, that there's a, it's, it's at best disparate the way information on extant licences and operational pubs is gathered. Um, I would urge people who want to read about this to go and read the House of Commons Library uh, document, which does actually uh, uh, gather this stuff. Um, into, um, into a useful format, but I do think it would be useful to have it done uh, by DFC. Let me say again, on that amendment, I am again open to, if my amendment passes, to looking at um, clarifications or amendments at uh, further consideration stage uh, around technicalities. I am aware that this is not something that was uh, debated in detail by the committee, so, and the department has been very busy. If the department wishes to engage on further detail, should the amendment Pass, um, I, I would be more than happy to, to, to discuss and engage on that. I won't go through the other amendments in detail because I think there's broad um, support for them, and the minister explained what they do in, in detail. And I think, since we all want to get to them, um, I will uh, at that point um, close. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, members, um, for participating in this particular debate. Um, we now move to Amendment 45, which has been proposed. So, Amendment proposed before clause 19, insert new clause, independent review of the licensing system and surrender principle. The question is that Amendment 45 be made and the new clause added to the Bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we no? Aye. If we don't, it's not clear then the, whether it's a pass or a fail. So, um, Clear lobbies. The question will be put in three minutes.
Okay, members. Order, members. We'll resume the business. Thank you, members. Thank you, members. All members. Thank you. Okay. Okay, members. Before I put the question, I will again remind those members present that, if possible, it would be preferable if we could avoid a division. That being said, the question is that Amendment 45 be made and the new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. no. Aye. Do we have tellers? Members, tellers for the ayes are Claire Sugden and Pat Cadney. Tellers for the noes, Carl Lee Killen and Sinead Annis. Clear lobbies, the assembly will divide. Ayes to my right. Ayes to my right, noes to my left.
Secure the doors, please.
Okay, members. Let's call the order then. And the clerk, could you please read the result? 83 members voted. 57 members voted aye. 26 members voted no. The amendment is carried. The amendment is carried. The amendment is carried. Thank, thank you. Moving on then to Amendment 46, which has already been debated. So, Amendment 46 has already been debated. I call Matthew O'Toole to move formally Amendment 46. Amendment proposed before Clause 19 insert new clause annual publication of the number of operational liquor licences. The question is that Amendment 46 be made and the new clause added to the Bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we know? I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Thank you. Clauses 19 to 21 stand part. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 19 to 21. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. If there are no objections, then the question is that clauses, clauses 19 to 21 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 22. The question is that clause 22 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. Amendment 47 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 47. Moved. Amendment proposed after clause 22 insert new clause. Consent required for alterations to premises. The question is that Amendment 47 be made and a new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clause 23. The question is the clause 23 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. Amendment. 48 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargey, to move formally Amendment 48. Moved. Amendment proposed after Clause 23 insert new clause removal of restrictions on late opening on Sunday. The question is that Amendment 48 be made and a new clause added to the Bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. All those in favour say aye. 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 The contrary, no. Do the eyes have it? Do the eyes have it? The eyes have it. Thank you, members. Clause 24 stand part. No amendments have been tabled to Clause 24. The question is that Clause 24 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Country no. The eyes have it. Do the eyes have it? The eyes have it. Thank you. Amendment 49 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 49. Moved. Amendment proposed after Clause 24 insert new clause increase in number of authorisations for special occasions. The question is that Amendment 49 be made and the new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Country no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So we are moving directly to Amendment 50. I will not call Amendment 50 as it is mutually exclusive with Amendment 49, which has been made. Clauses 25 and 26 down part. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 25 or 26. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 25 and 26 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. Thank you. Amendment 51 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 51. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 27, page 29, line 8, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 51 be made. All those in favour say aye. Can't we know? The ayes have it. 
The question is, is Clause 27, as amended, stand part of the Bill? All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 52 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 52. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 28, page 29, line 29, leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 52 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that Clause 28 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 53 has. Right. Just bear with me a second, please. Okay, we're going, we're going to clause 28. So it's the question is that clause 28, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 53 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 53. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 29, page 30, line 8. Leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 53 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 54 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Dairy Hargy, to move formally Amendment 54. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 29, page 30, line 25. Leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is, is that Amendment 54 be made? All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 55 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Dairy Hargy, to move formally Amendment 55. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 29, page 30, line 29. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 55 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clause 29 as amended. The question is that Clause 29 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 56 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 56. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 30, page 30, line 41, insert words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 56 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 57 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally. Amendment 57. Moved. Amendment proposed to Clause 30, page 31, line 6, middle column. Leave out and insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 57 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clause 30 as amendment. Sorry. The question is that Clause 30 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to Clauses 31 or 32. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that Clauses 31 and 32 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Amendment 58 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 58. Moved. Amendment proposed before Clause 33 insert new clause guidance. The question is that Amendment 58 be made and the new clause added to the bill. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 59 has already been debated. I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 59. Moved. Amendment proposed before Clause 33 insert new clause review. The question is that Amendment 59 be made and the new clause added to the Bill. 
All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. No amendments have been tabled to clauses 33 to 35. I propose by leave of the Assembly to group these clauses for the question on stand part. The question is that clauses 33 to 35 stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. Amendment 60 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Dairy Hargy, to move formally Amendment 60. Moved. Amendment proposed to clause 36, page 33, line 24, leave out words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 60 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it. The question is that clause 36 as amended stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Can't be no. The ayes have it. Option double E. Amendment 61 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Dairy Hargy, to move formally. Amendment 61. Moved. Amendment proposed to Schedule 1, page 34, line 11. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 61 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Amendment 62 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Dairy Hargy, to move formally Amendment 62. Moved. Amendment proposed to Schedule 1, page 35, line 34. Insert words as printed on the Marshall list. Question is that Amendment 62 be made. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that Schedule 1, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are we on? Just pardon. <laughs> Amendment 63 has already been debated, and I call the Minister for Communities, Deirdre Hargy, to move formally Amendment 63. Moved. Amendment proposed to Schedule 2, page 37, line 5. Insert words <coughs> as printed on the Marshall list. The question is that Amendment 63 be made. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes definitely have it. Schedule, the question is that Schedule 2, as amended, stand part of the bill. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is that the long title be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. That concludes the consideration stage of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill, and the bill stands referred to the Speaker. And the Next item on the order paper is the adjournment. The question is that the Assembly do now adjourn. The Assembly is adjourned. Good night, DOI, and good luck.